So I think we've got a, a, our group tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and um, call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on Tuesday, June 9th, 2020 to order. My name is Janet Godwin. I wanna thank those on Zoom for joining us tonight. Um, a few introductions, Superintendent Steve Merle, Directors Lisa Williams, Paul Ressler, Sean Eiston, Rathina Malone, J.P. Clausen, Charlie Eastham, and Kim Colvin, Recording Secretary, are joining us tonight along with a number of uh, other guests and staff. Before I turn to the community comment section of the agenda, I, I would like to say a few words reiterate, reiterating a message that our district sent uh, earlier um, uh, about uh, the, the tragic events um, regarding George Floyd's death. And just to say a few words from that statement, um, this district will not tolerate racism, hate, and other discriminatory acts. Our hearts hurt for you and we are committed to actions that will help us see the change that is long overdue. As a community, it is upon us to work for a better tomorrow and to come together to create just that. I want to, I want to show the commitment of the school board to that statement and add a few words um, of my own into the mix. I want to say that we're all committed to public education, all of us on this call and, and so many of us in our community. We believe public education is one of the strongest means to stamping out systemic racism, but we also need to focus and make sure that our students have access to education that our curriculum highlights without hesitation the harm, racism, and bias inflicts on our society. We need to help our students learn to listen, to talk, to learn, to build skills in communication and seeing beyond their own experiences and to empathize. And then we need to help our students build confidence in speaking out, help them be confident in taking action and to do so with moral authority, knowing that action against racism is right. We wanna educate students so that they will carry the torch forward to continue the fight for justice. I'd like to end by personally thanking all the local, uh, local elected officials who've contributed their voice to this movement. And I'd especially like to thank Ruthina Malone, Lucretia Harrington, Royce Ann Porter, and Bruce Teague for not only leading, but, to do, but, but for doing so with courage and grace. And I know many of our other directors would like to few, make a few comments before we turn into our agenda. And I think, um, I know Ruthina and you, and you and Lisa both would like to say some words and I'll turn it over to Ruthina first. Uh, thank you, President Godwin. So um, I did have uh, just a few words I wanted to say um, to our students, teachers, and administrators who have felt and seen the pain and effects of systematic racism and oppression. I see you and I am with you. Thank you for raising your voices to let our community know that enough is enough. Change must be made and that black lives matter just as much as any others. Even though I am one of six, I will do my part to work towards making sure that change happen here within the Iowa City Community School District. I also want to work to see that our school board better reflects our community that we serve based on racial and economical de demographics to ensure that all voices are heard and seen. Um, 2020 has been a year for the unexpected, but also the year of knocking down barriers and to making lasting change. And I know the fight has just begun, but I'm happy to be in this community to ensure that the fight continues and that work and change happens. Thank you, Bethina. Lisa? Thank you, President Godwin. Um, I wanted to express that I find the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others at the hands of the police, as well as the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey, to be horrifying. These events have reinforced what many Black, Indigenous, and people of color have known their entire lives, that our systems of government, our police, housing, healthcare, and more are built on the pillars of institutionalized racism and white supremacy. And some racism is expressed through explicit acts, but most is sustained through silent agreements among those with privilege. It will take a tremendous amount of work to dismantle these systems and rebuild them more equitably. And it will be very uncomfortable work for many of the white members of our community, but it is absolutely necessary work. Uh, nowhere 
are the poisonous fruits of systematic racism more critical to address than in our own public schools? Because education, uh, more than any other institution, is designed to perpetuate the aims of society. Uh, we, the board, the school administration, teachers and staff are entrusted by the community to be stewards of social change in the next generation. And because of that, change begins with us. Uh, to those who are protesting, I hear you and I am listening. The fact that so many of the peaceful protesters calling for change are young people who attended or attend schools in the Iowa City Community School District gives me some hope in what we are doing as a school system. Uh, but we cannot just listen. We must translate the concerns raised by community members in these protests into concrete action. And we, the board, must craft policies to create a culture in our school where students of color feel safe, seen, and supported. We must do more to close the achievement gap, starting with early childhood education. And students of color need to be taught and mentored by more adults that look like them. I want to make clear to the community that I am uh, committed to this work and I will hold the administration, the board and myself accountable until we see some results. Thank you, Lisa. Um, other directors, uh, would others like to say a few words? I would like to <clears throat> say something. Um, I sat there today trying to uh, put together a written statement and I would start and I'd stop and start and stop. And as I reflect on it now, I realize that that's part of the problem is that I'm so afraid to say the right thing that I don't say anything and haven't for some time. And while I've always thought that uh, I'm not really part of the problem, um, what I am, uh, I have my own uh, internal biases that I've struggled for a long time to identify and overcome. Uh, but not being part of the problem is not enough. We have to be part of the solution. And that's what uh, I'm committing to. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna try and make this simple because if I vamp, I'm gonna start crying. So I'm just gonna say black lives matter. Our black students lives matter. When we talk about systemic racism, we have a school system. That's a system that I have been charged to try and put on the right path. I think everybody on this call is committed to putting our district on the right path. Um, so as a board member, I'm committed to doing that. But as a system, our whole country is a system and has issues. And as a human being, we need, I need to do better outside of just this platform as well. But I am committed to just using my voice that has generally remained silent for quite some time and my apologies for having done so because I have been part of the problem and I want to turn the page to be part of the solution. I also offer all my thanks to those out there who have been working on this tirelessly for years and I am joining your fight. And my promise to you is that I will not leave it anytime. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, others? Yeah, Janet, I'll just <clears throat> comment. I and thank you for that, Sean. I, I really appreciate that. That, that that's really hard uh, to do uh, privately and in a public fashion. Um, I appreciate that honesty. Uh, you know, I'm trying really hard. Uh, you know, I spent uh, three days uh, over the weekend listening a lot, um, listening to Roy San and Bruce, uh, Ruthina, Rakisha. Um, uh, some of the most powerful statements came from the students our stu current and former students who spoke at, at various events. And while I know that the way we can tackle some of this is, is through public education, you know, I think we also have, have to recognize how much a part, a direct part of the problem our school system has been. And that's something I heard over and over again, um, where our students' experiences in our schools, their, their experiences with racism from from our staff and from our folks and other students. And so starting, and you know, I know we've started this work, um, but when we started the Patel work in the spring, going back to last summer when we were working on the Sea Deep, um, 
students said, you know, we never talk about this stuff in school. I've never learned about any of this. I don't know what redlining is. I don't know what black codes are. And the hopeful part, there's two things I'll point out. One, that's curriculum and we have 100% control over our curriculum. We can just change that. We can change that in August. We don't have to wait for anything. And the other thing that gave me a lot of hope were the large number of not just students, but teachers and administrators who were out in these protests, joining voices. And that gives me hope that we've got the people who are committed to this work. Uh, and I too will lend my voice at Black Lives Matter. And I am in this movement. And like Sean said, I'm not leaving. And like Lisa said, and Ruthies has indicated, we need to see some change. Thanks, JP. Any other comments? If you don't mind, Janet, um, I really want to uh, <clears throat> express my gratitude to you, uh, Ruthina, Lisa, uh, Sean, JP, Paul, um, for being a board that I think is uh, committed uh, to changing the um, changing the experience of students of color in these school in this school district. Um, we have begun um, a, a task that uh, a lot of other districts have, uh, have uh, uh, frankly, uh, committed themselves to undertake. Uh, this is going to be a difficult, uh, uh, it's going to be difficult to change the outcomes for students of color in this or any other district. Uh, most of you have already expressed one way or the other about why that is what the challenge that we're facing. Um, I would invite, I would like to invite the staff of the district, uh, the, uh, the entire board, students and the community to, uh, to working together to, <clears throat> to change what we all know are uh, uh, totally unacceptable uh, proficiency and uh, disciplinary uh, experiences of students of color in the district. Uh, <clears throat> we've started to talk about the implicit bias among uh, all of us, and we've started to talk about cultural competency among all of us. We're going to have to have many, many, many more conversations about those, those, those areas. And we're going to have to have a substantial, uh, significant conversations about con uh, holding, uh, uh, holding ourselves, the entire district, accountable for making the changes that we have to make. Um, I'm. Uh, personally committed to doing that. I'm probably not the best person to actually be doing it, but that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you and the staff in the district uh, and the students in the district as we uh, become the district we need to be. Thank you, Charlie. Any other comments? Uh, and I'll just, I guess I'll finish up, Janet. Um, I just wanted to echo kind of what Charlie said. I'm really um, happy to have the other six board members that we have uh, on this board. I feel like we are all committed um, to do whatever it takes um, to make changes and impact the students and the faculty and staff in our district um, in a positive way. Um, I was uh, at the protest Saturday morning when the um, Teachers Association kind of um, asked, put out the call for their, their teachers to come out and uh, Brady, I will say to you guys that that turnout was great to see. Um, the amount of teachers that were there, staff, administration, um, there to support the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And I was happy to be there myself. And then also um, um, Mitch Gross and his event that he helped put on on Saturday or Sunday um, in Coralville, uh, not only with uh, teachers that spoke, but the students, as JP uh, mentioned, were very powerful, not only in their voice, um, what they had to say, but um, they also 
sang and they also did um, dance, um, interpretive dance. That was, um, you know, their way of speaking out and being heard. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, during my time on the board, I know that I have not always made um, the decisions that were necessarily maybe right. Um, I've tried to do my best um, to support uh, this cause and making the change in this district. And I'm committed to continuing to do that. Um, I appreciate what all the other board members said. And instead of me repeating what they said, I think their comments will stand on their own and I'll turn it back over to Janet. Thanks, Paul. And thank, thank you all for those strong statements of commitment. Um, and so I will move now to uh, community comment portion of the meeting. Um, members of the public wishing to speak during the public comment may do so by raising the raise hand feature. Um, during community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And with that said, I believe we do have uh, Tina, um, who's raised hand, when, and I think you're ready to go. Looks like you may still be on mute, but you have the floor. I think you may be muted. There you go. Cannot hear you. Are you talking? Um, I don't know. I don't. It, it there. It looks like you're unmuted, Tina. But when no one's hearing you, unless others are hearing, and I'm not. Nope. No one's. No one is hearing you. Um. Check audio. I don't know if anyone on the phone is skilled in technical support <laughs> to help this, but um, I feel terrible that um, we're not able to hear Tina make comments. Um, and if we're not able to hear the audio, um, perhaps it would be possible for Tina to submit comments via email to the board and we can make sure that they're appended to our, um, to our uh, minutes. They won't be part of the recording, but they can be appended to the minutes of the meeting tonight. Janet, I, I do know that Tina already did email the board, so maybe um, we can take that, that email that she sent. Um, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, we'll, we'll plan on doing that. Um, and so are there other folks um, uh, on the attendee side that would like to make comments this evening? If so, just use the raise hand feature. Looks like we're making progress with so, Tina. We see your name on the screen, but still no audio. I apologize that we're having audio issues tonight. Um, and so we will we'll follow up uh, by appending the email that you sent. Do you wanna try again? Looks like your mic is muted, unmuted. Hello? Yay, we can hear Yay, you. Yay, awesome. can you hear me? That's great. So I'll go on mute, please. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you. And I'm sorry, I'm a little slow with that. Uh-oh. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. That was, just, that was just the timer coming on screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Wonderful. So my name is Tina Tlander. Um, my son is Kelby. He is um, going to be a senior at Liberty High School. Um, my reason for this is I wanted to, I'm just so concerned with the return to learn and everything that's getting ready to happen. I thought, why not be proactive? I want to get as much information out there ahead of time. Um, so you great people that are working on this and have so much on your plate um, could have some information that I know from our standpoint would be helpful. Um, Kelby, like I said, is going to be a senior. He's hearing impaired. Um, he is completely deaf, wears a cochlear implant on his left side. Um, he has a 504. And just, I want to give you, you've got a lot of the logistics in the email that I worked very hard to, come, um, to get together. I reached out to Kelly's hearing itinerant teacher who has been with us since he was uh, a baby. And she gave me a, a lot of help to, um, to help me get some of the information to you. But 
I think there's a lot of solid information there. The biggest thing I wanted to speak about today was to give you kind of a little personal insight to the type of person and the kind of person Kelby is. So you understand where I'm coming from. Um, he is a very hard worker. He advocates for himself incredibly. Um, he's a 4.0 student. He's in Best Buddies. He's Honor Society. He's in PALS. Um, he got elected this year as a nominee for the Youth Salute program. So he is a very dedicated and hard worker and will do everything he can to make things a success. Um, I've just never seen anything like we're dealing with with the masks. Um, we've even tried the plastic little portion where you can have a plastic mask and the cloth around it. I have some here. I don't know if you can see me anymore. It just, um, it, you can see how it's muffled still. And this is what, he only gets a certain percent of what is being said anyway. And when we put the barriers of the mask um, along with um, the decreased noise, we were at a gas station the other day. He went in to go pay for something and literally could not even understand the person that was wearing the mask, obviously the cashier across from him as she um, said the change. She said, I had no idea if she was talking to me, who she was talking to. He relies on the entire face to be seen. Even if it's just the mouth, he doesn't get to see the cheek movement. He lip reads so much, which has contributed to his success, the combination. Um, if you were not to have that, I, I don't know where we would be to see the whole face. And then you put the, the, the system in the hat system or the FM, and you worry about how that's ever going to get muffled and get to him. Um, and it's not just with the teacher, it's, it's with his peers. He has to be able to hear the discussions taking place in classrooms. Um, and I can't imagine being a senior that's worked so hard and you get to school and you have no communication with anyone. Um, I just, I fear it greatly. Um, at dentist office the other day, he said, mom, will you please do the talking with the receptionist? I know I'm not gonna understand anything. And he couldn't, they called his name in the waiting room. He stood up, it wasn't his name. You know, it was the other guy in the room. Um, it just, it goes on and on. And he said, I will never make it as a, as a student if, if this is what we have to do. Um, so I hope there's some good options out there for you. Um, I hope if you could have need any more information, I would greatly appreciate it if you would reach out to me. Um, if there's anything I or I could get Kim to help with, um, she's been the greatest resource and really knows him uh, well. But I, I know most importantly, it's about not leaving any child behind. And I just don't want the access issue um, to di dictate his success virtually. Um, I think that's most of what I had to say. Um, that's it. <laughs> That's all I've got, but I really thank you guys so much for giving me the time to do this. Um, it's not easy and, and you don't want to be another hurdle that you all have to go up against. So I just hope I can provide information that makes you see our side of it too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tina. I'm really happy that we were able to hear your, your comments tonight. I appreciate you hanging in there with us. Thank you so much. Janet, one, one comment for, for Tina, if you may. Um, Tina, I, I didn't know you before you sent this email, um, but I can say that I have um, had the pleasure of watching your son play sports <laughs> at Liberty. And had I not, had you not told me that he had that the hearing impediment, that he was deaf, I would have never known. And I think it's, uh, he's a tremendous athlete and I enjoy watching him and best of luck to him in the future. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you can still hear me. Oh, thank you so much for that. That is so nice of you to say. And he does. He gets along so well. I think that's just what's hard to, to, to believe, that it, it, can, it is that hard of a struggle for cert certain things. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Tina. So we will move on to our, um, our agenda approval. Um, we have a, an agenda for a June 9th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Thank you. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Uh, on our consent agenda, I know Ruthina, you sent a note saying you reviewed bills and did not have any questions. Um, any other questions from directors who may have reviewed the bills this period? Hearing none, are there any uh, consent agenda items directors would like to pull? Okay, uh, can I have a motion to approve our consent agenda? So moved. Second. 
think JP got in second. Uh, Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Uh, next up is our public hearing for a temporary construction easement at 1355 Barrington Road. Sean? Try to open two windows at the same time. Sorry about that. All right, now is the time and place for the public hearing on the district's proposed conveyance of a temporary construction easement at 1355 Barrington Road with legal descriptions provided in the attached documentation to the City of Iowa City. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on May 27th, 2020. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? All right, thank you, Sean, appreciate that. Now we'll move to our operations annual report. Um, Chase? Sure. Good evening. Uh, it's nice to be with you all this evening. Uh, Kim, I don't know if you will give me um, rights to share my screen. Does that I work? I sure will. Yep. Should have pre-planned this. We've been on so many Zoom meetings together. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're, we're very excited to present our annual report this evening to the board. This has been a long way in the making. Uh, originally, we were slotted to present this um, back in uh, February or, or early March, and then um, I went on paternity leave, and, and when I came back, we were in the middle of the pandemic. And so we've uh, had it on the shelf for a while, but um, better late than never. And so some of the information that you'll see this evening is uh, spans both the 1819 school year, because originally that's where this would have been for the previous school year, and so I know it's a little odd that we're now at the end of the 1920 and we're giving this report, but hopefully over the course of next, the next year, we can get back on, um, on a better cycle. We have posted the um, full report in board docs. It was up last week. It's about 50 pages and I really appreciate everyone uh, on the team's hard work in putting those sections together and also the blueprint that was laid out for us from curriculum uh, and instruction folks in the winter when they gave their report. But tonight, we want to give a brief overview before we open it up to questions from the board to focus on the areas that you really want to dive a little deeper in and uh, all the directors are, are going to help me out with this. But our first slide this evening is just to give a, a brief overview for those that um, haven't seen the changes that we've made to, to this side of the house in the last couple of years to our operations division. It does house nine uh, departments and, and offices and is led by six directors and myself as part of our operations team working daily to provide that background support and operational functions to make sure that uh, our facilities and all those supports are in place to support our teachers and our students with the, with the learning that's going inside of our classroom. Among our teams, about 330 dedicated employees, and we've had the privilege of highlighting several of them over the last four months as they've done work uh, for the district during the, uh, the pandemic, specifically our nutrition services team and some of our custodial staff as they kept buildings clean and we continue to feed children throughout the last uh, several months. But tonight, it's an opportunity to hear from our directors about all of the great work taking, uh, taking place in our operations department. So with that, I'll kick it over to Les to start with business and finance. Uh, thank you, Chase, and thank you, board members. Uh, you know, as we uh, head into the opening of baseball and softball, it's my honor to lead off tonight in this presentation. So uh, with that, um, my portion of the report is a little bit different than some of the other departments uh, that you're gonna see tonight. And that's because you see a lot of my reports and the things that come from the business office throughout the year with the budget process that's done uh, in the January through April process, uh, the CAR process that's done in September, the audit report that's done uh, in December and presented to you, and then quarterly reports. So you, you uh, are touched by some of the things that the business office does on a regular basis. But I've tried to summarize just a couple things here tonight. Uh, the district does have an overall budget of about $300 million, 170 that 
million of that is the general fund, and that is where we pay our teachers and our staff to provide the instruction and meet the primary uh, mission of the school district. Our department is also responsible uh, for the financial reporting and budgeting to uh, local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, that's done on a, on, a, on a regular basis. Most of the state and federal stuff is done on a quarterly basis these days. So uh, there's regular ongoing reporting that takes place uh, and supported by members of the business office team. We do uh, complete the comprehensive annual financial report uh, annually, uh, more commonly known as the audit report. We have submitted to ASBO International and the Government Finance Officials Association for 13 consecutive years and received a certificate of recognition in that reporting aspect. So uh, I'm pretty proud of that, that uh, it's a program that we started, we maintained, and uh, it's just a small indication that uh, we're doing things the right way in terms of at least financially reporting uh, to our stakeholders. The business office has been critical in assisting with the facility master plan and the general obligation bond sales. And, and actually, I didn't put it on here, but it goes back to the saved revenue bonds that we issued uh, prior to that, uh, that uh, started the facility master plan. And then when the voters approved $191.5 million uh, referendum in September of 2017, we followed up with those bonds that have supported that and the, the fine work that uh, Dwayne's team, the facilities team that you'll hear a little bit later are doing to support our uh, instructional programs throughout the district. We also process the payroll. Uh, we do two payrolls a month and approximately 2,000 uh, full-time employees as well as a fair number of substitutes, temporary employees and that nature. Uh, I just processed our direct deposit file today for uh, June 15th, and there was 2,200 people paid uh, next week in that file. So it tells you how many uh, part-time and temporary people that we have even in, in this time. And then we also work to manage the uh, asset protection program for the district from a property liability and workers' compensation coverage. And you heard that specific report uh, at the last board meeting and how we go about that. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to the next director, uh, are we taking questions at the end or do you want questions now, Chase? At the end. Okay, so facilities team, take it away. Thanks, Les, and thank you board members for allowing us to bring this report tonight. Obviously, you know, a big uh, part of our work has been the facility master plan and I have to first thank the board for allowing us to keep you on track with our appendix nines every board meeting. They get approved and without that, we wouldn't be able to keep our projects on time. We wouldn't be able to pay our bills. And so I, I want you to know that I know you approve the plans and designs and all that along the way. And sometimes it gets a little boring, but uh, we couldn't uh, have done it without you. And over the last nine years, we've calculated, and this is part of the Steve Mur Murley legacy is 430 million plus in projects. And that includes the facility master plan, that includes Pebble, general obligation, sales tax, and that, that's quite a legacy for Steve to leave the district on. And, and I just wanted to point that out because that, that's, it's been quite, quite the investment that we've made in our children for the last nine years and the community. But in addition to all that, the 170 employees that we have, uh, we, we manage 30 some buildings, uh, we there are 35 buildings, I guess. We have 30 modulars. Those 30 modulars include 60 classrooms, actually. So that adds to our workload as well. And I might add, too, that the facility master plan was accelerated by three years with what we calculated as a very conservative savings and in inflation, so at least $10 million, uh, that we were able to then put back into our project. So I think that, that was a positive part of that. And I also wanted to make a note that Two of our projects have got received a local historical preservation award, and that's Longfellow and Mann. And you're going to hear about this hopefully in the next few weeks when they loosen up the governor's office a little bit. But there's a state award coming for Mann Elementary as well. So we're pretty pleased to have received that and be acknowledged at the state level for one of our projects. Uh, we manage, like I said, 35 buildings, 30 modulars, 617 acres of land which is an 8% increase over the previous year. Uh, and just a, a simple little fact, we have 21 
wood gymnasium floors in the district that we have to refinish every summer. So there are things like that that are not seen always by the public, but when you put it all together, it's a pretty awesome task. 2.7 million square feet. I checked today and I, I found out that the Corville Mall has 1.187 million square feet. So we're two and a quarter times the size of the Corville Mall. So that's how much square footage we clean on a daily basis in this district. Uh, that's, that's saying something. Uh, we have 109 custodians that do that. They, they all approximately do about 30,000 square feet on a daily basis. And what's the average home in Iowa City? 2,000 square feet. So they're each cleaning 15 homes at a minimum on a daily basis. And we're cleaning the Coralville Mall two and a quarter times. And with our return to learn program, I got to suspect that we're going to be cleaning these buildings more often than we are now. So there's going to be a lot of work yet to come. Uh, we have 15 athletic fields, we have 10 practice venues, and we have 15 miles of fence, which may not seem like much, but there's only like two or three guys that work on those athletic venues. We're pretty particular about who works on them. We've got a young man named Mike Murphy that does a great job. Uh, in addition to that, we had 17 snow events last year. So we plowed, every time that happened, we plowed 18 miles of sidewalks, 54 acres of parking lots and 13 acres of playground. So we have 28 full-time employees on that snow team, 15 snow plows, five tractors, two mechanics, six guys that do nothing but run a snow shovel and three substitutes. That in itself is a pretty awesome task, but that was one of those side benefits of bringing the grounds team back in house back in 2013. David Duty and I worked on that. We, we, we knew there were a lot of benefits that the district would, would perceive or receive by having those full-time employees. The tree canopy covers over 50% of our acres. Over 50% of the acreage out there has trees on it. We have to maintain that. And with the Emerald Ash Borer, it's become an awesome task. And we have a young City High graduate, Jess Holland, who's become our tree expert, who does a great job maintaining the trees. We've gotten on top of that. We've created tree rings so that we won't have to mow right next to them. We've done a lot of things to maintain our tree canopy. And for every tree we remove, we, remove, we try and plant at least two more. So we've done our part in re, re greening the city, so to speak. Uh, and I mentioned Mike Murphy a little while ago. The grounds team as a team received a very prestigious award for the work that they've done on Bates Field. Bates Field is, it is so much better than when we first got here. You don't see bare spots on Bates Field anymore. You don't see as many kids getting hurt. You see a nice lush green turf that they've worked really, really hard to get. And they were very deserving of that award last year. Something else uh, we started this year was testing radon in all our schools. And up till now, the state of Iowa has required that we do our preschool rooms on, our, on a semi-annual basis, or excuse me, every two years, whatever that correct word is, biannual basis. Uh, but we took it upon ourselves trying to be proactive, and we are now going to do every ground level room in all our schools and testing for radon uh, on our own and do it on a three-year rotation. You guys approved that not too long ago, and I think that's going to be a very very uh, good program to have it demonstrate that we are taking radon seriously and that we do ventilation projects and we've improved the air indoor air quality in our buildings and hand in hand with indoor air quality up till about a year ago we did three on the average 300 sprays of pesticide per year in 2019 we did zero so that's quite an accomplishment for ben and his team and the ipm and dave mckenzie and those guys have worked really hard to make that to make that program work uh, and we also created in the last year, a couple years, I guess should say, is a, a pest management or buffer zone around our buildings. For example, if you go to Liberty High School, and Scott can tell you this, so we put a buffer of gravel all the way around that building to cut down on weed weeds, which cuts down on pests and vermin that, that are around the buildings, things like that. So I could go on and on. I know it's my time is up, but we've done a lot of things to, I think, make our environment better. And, 
I'll pass it on to my uh, co-partner, Nick Proud, I believe is up next. Uh, it's me, Jeremy. Um, oh, excuse me, Jeremy. Uh, no, you're good. No, you're good. No problem, Dwayne. Um, so working with the uh, equity, and sorry for anyone, uh, I'm Jeremy Tabor, Director of Equity and Employee Relations uh, here with the district. Um, part of my main responsibilities is to, um, you know, work and investigate any, any complaints of bullying, harassment, discrimination by uh, students, staff, uh, and or parents. Um, so far this year, we received um, was nine formal complaints um, for the district and we were able to resolve all of those um, complaints. We have, excuse me, it was uh, six um, OC, OCR, Office, Office of Civil Rights complaints. Um, we actually, unfortunately, just received another one, but we've been able to resolve uh, two of those complaints um, satisfactorily and the others are, are still pending. Um, in terms of uh, you know looking at some of the other things that we have on the on our plate, um, you know in terms of uh, from an OSHA standpoint, we've uh, responded to a complaint that the district had from late uh, in the 2018-19 school year that was um, had a couple questions come back on that, but overall um, the OSHA has been um, pretty satisfied with the response that we've submitted. They did have a couple follow-up questions, and we did get those um, answered here uh, within the last week or so. Um, one of the other things I, that I'm responsible for is, uh, is equity, um, and I work very closely with uh, Laura Gray, our Director of uh, Diversity and Cultural Responsiveness um, in the Equity Department. And, um, you know, looking at some of our, our stats within the equity team, um, you know, right now our district has a, about a 15%, 16% um, diversity uh, workforce, and out of that group, about 7% of our teachers fall into that category. Um, and, and my colleague, Nick, is gonna go a little bit more into the, uh, the hiring and kind of where the district is with that standpoint. But um, you know, looking ac across the state and where the state is, about 2.2% of the state's um, teacher population is minority. And you know, it's definitely not where we want to be, but from an Iowa City standpoint, I think we are continuing to move in the, in the right direction with increasing our, work, our workforce diversity. Um, trying to think if I'm missing anything else. Oh, um, our um, couple other things that we have coming up or that are on the plate for myself. Um, we've had some recent uh, changes to Title IX uh, legislation, which will um, require some, some significant effort on uh, our part as a district leadership team to make sure that we get those implemented. Uh, we're going to work very closely with uh, a lot of the other um, um, employee relations and uh, HR folks across the state just to make sure that we're um, implementing those guidelines uh, correctly. Um, we've seen a lot more or we'll see a lot more um, intense um, record keeping related to that, a more broad definition of what um, constitutes sexual harassment. Um, our record keeping and our um, standard of evidence will increase, but then also the complaint investigation and, uh, and grievance processes are, are very, um, very much enhanced and put in place so that there is no bias as we go through the uh, go through the process for that. Um, and then lastly, you know, just want to reference the diversity, equity, and inclusion plan that's uh, was was created and put in place earlier this school year. You know, it goes without being said that that's going to be huge for us as a district um, as we look to work towards and, and meeting the goals in that plan. Um, you know, I'm sure the board is going to want to follow up with us, uh, you know, on a regular basis about that, but it's something that I know as a, a district and as a leadership team, we want to continue to work towards um, meeting and, and, and surely exceeding the goals that are, that are put, forth, put forth in that plan, and I think we're very much uh, up to the task. Um, so I'll go ahead and throw it over to, uh, to Nick. All right, thank you so much uh, for letting us share tonight. I'm happy to kind of represent our HR team and Jeremy did allude to the great work that we do together with as a team to work on a variety of different things for the district. And beyond, so we wanted to highlight a few things tonight. Um, obviously we take care of the day-to-day -day operations that happen within HR and we have a wonderful team that takes care of so many things from uh, substitute services to uh, working with our employees to help support them through all sorts of situations. But we really want to highlight a few different things. We're really excited about our 
uh, districts grow your own progress that we've been making and the four pronged approach. And when we talk about a four pronged approach, we're really talking about how we can help uh, individuals, whether they be students, um, some of our support staff or community members or individuals be able to work towards their goal of becoming an educator. And we have some great partnerships with the Kirkwood Regional Center, uh, a new one with Mount Mercy University, and then the University of Iowa that's allowing us to help try to achieve some of those goals. Um, I should probably, I'll skip down to the third point here because I think it's a critical one too of just as Jeremy talked about the average being two point, well, they're hiring about 4%. We've been able to hire at about 10% of diverse candidates over the last five years. And one celebration we had this year was uh, this December, uh, we were adding some additional staff and 38% of the elementary teachers that we were able to hire were diverse candidates, which we were excited about. And that happened through kind of the active recruitment of student teachers of color that were in our building and reaching out to them and talking to them about the possibilities of being in the Iowa State Schools. And we're excited about um, that progress. And we've also had some great hiring information going on this spring that I'll look forward to reporting out later on. Um, we've had some great success by implementing some on-site job fairs and also on-site application events. So that way, uh, I think to our application events, we've been able to get some great employees that just struggled with the barrier of our application. And we were there, we had translators with us, and we helped people navigate the applications. That way they could apply for a job. And we hired numerous people from just one night and uh, looking forward to doing some more of those events as we go on. And then also just we continue uh, right now under the current circumstances, onboarding people is very difficult. So we've worked to uh, modernize that program, going to more of an all online. We still want to have that personal touch. We'll get Chase in the video here before long with his smiling face. Um, but uh, we'll be able to onboard our new employees in a more, I would say, current method than probably what we have in the past, and we're excited about the progress that we're making there. So I'll kick that over to whoever, who's next up on our category. Awesome. Nutrition Services. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the Nutrition Services Department. We are a diverse department of about 130 staff. We offer a variety of programs across the district to meet the needs of all of our students. We have a universal breakfast program at five elementary schools that have the highest free and reduced percentages. That is Alexander, Hills, Kirkwood, Twain, and Wood. We have the community eligibility program at Tate. They are the only school that currently qualifies um, the requirement for that is a high um, directly certified percentage. We apply each year for the USDA Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Grant, and we are in the process of applying again for this next year. Um, those same five elementary schools typically qualify. Um, you have to have at least a 50% free and reduced percentage in order to uh, apply. Um, when it comes to menu planning, um, that starts with our USDA guidelines. That we have a strict set of guidelines we must follow. We also work to meet the diverse needs of our students and their preferences. We provide special diets to students to meet their medical needs, their allergic needs. We have uh, integrated software programs that um, provide point of sale software for us back of the house software, which is things like our inventory management, as well as recipes, some of our menu planning. And then what people most see is our uh, meal viewer program, which provides that nutritional information to um, students and families about our menus. Very proud to partner with Field to Family and Farm to School to source local produce each year. We are using the newly established Food Hub to again source local produce this year. Um, we are just kind of coming into season here in Iowa, but throughout the pandemic, we've used a lot of yogurt from um, a dairy in Hawkeye, Iowa, because we weren't able to source any other yogurt in, in the middle of the pandemic. So this past year, we used about 30,000 pounds of local produce and we are on track to exceed that this year. When it comes to meal production, we utilize a centralized food production system. We have four large production kitchens, Liberty, West, City and Northwest, that not only make food for themselves, but deliver to all the elementary schools as well as Tate and the Transition Center. North, Central, and Southeast are smaller kitchens, but they produce food for themselves, for the students there. 
the nutrition department is a categorically funded department. So we're kind of our own island. We have to be self-sustaining. Since 2016, our revenues have exceeded our expenditures, which we're always thankful for. And even in this pandemic, I think we're on track to finish the year in the black. So it definitely takes the whole team working together to achieve those results. The nutrition department oversees student accounts. We have seen our participation increase each year. And while our enrollment also incre has increased, I do believe that um, our increase in participation is due to our um, compelling menus and the hard work that the nutrition staff do each day in preparing um, not only nutritious food, but delicious food that looks good and kids want to come eat with us. That's our goal always. Along with increasing participation, um, unfortunately, we have some increasing debt. Um, that is not only a local issue here, but that is a national issue with, with no easy answers. We see our greatest debt at the elementary level with somewhere between 78 and 84 percent of our overall debt from elementary students. Um, the good news during the pandemic is that we didn't incur any more debt. It was because all of the kids ate for free, which is wonderful. Um, during this pandemic, since uh, March 23rd, we have served nearly 273,000 meals. Um, we are in summer mode now with a few fewer sites, but we are continuing with those summer grab and go options. I'll turn it over to Adam and Tech. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in technology, as as most of you on the board know, um, you know our our last few months has really been dominated by COVID response and return to learn planning, uh, with preparation for the fall in particular in mind. A um, few things, though, that I do want to mention about our recent and current work. Um, we've done quite a bit to provide professional development resources for teachers making the rapid switch to online instruction instruction in the spring. Uh, that was a real focus for us and, and the feedback I've gotten with regard to a lot of our professional development resources, especially at the elementary level, um, has been quite good. So we're looking to build on that for the fall. Um, certainly we're working towards our K-12 one-to-one implementation in the fall. I won't go into a ton of detail on that since we covered that a couple weeks ago. Um, we're also currently working with community partners, including uh, local ISPs, uh, municipal representatives, and ICAD to try to address home internet access for students in the fall. Um, you know, we're committed to providing uh, connectivity or ensuring that connectivity exists for the duration of the period where students need to engage in remote work. Um, or where we, where we may need to transition to a remote setting on short notice. So, you know, we know that that home connectivity piece is really critical. Um, and so that's a, a piece that we want to make sure we're working now to make solid once we get to the start of the school year in particular. Um, moving on to a couple of things that aren't necessarily related directly to our, our COVID response. Uh, one is the, the clarity survey. So we use this each year. Um, to measure our progress as a, as a technology pr program broadly. Um, Clarity Survey is a program evaluation instrument uh, really designed to assess the effectiveness of technology programming, um, ranging from IT services to instructional technology, technology access, and utilization of technology in the classroom. Um, We've had a couple of really good years in a row. Um, we've actually seen our overall score increase for four consecutive years. Um, but this year we set uh, subcategory highs um, in every category for the second year in a row. Uh, and including the access category, which as you know, has been a real emphasis of mine for the last few years, um, trying to ensure access and equitable access both within and outside the classroom. Um, we had a record high score in that area and are, per the, the way it's broken out within the survey um, tool, we are now in the exemplary category. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of is that we've, at this point, in all of the category scores and the overall, exceeded regional, state, and national averages. So, um, you know, when we look at that consistent improvement, I think it affirms that we're headed in a positive direction with our technology services and instructional technology programming. 
Um, that said, you know, I think it remains to be seen how this will improve our resiliency or impact our resiliency as we face um, a potentially shifting instructional model in the fall. You know, I think we're well positioned, um, but we need to, you know, in fairly short order, amplify a lot of what we've done uh, so that it's more impactful. And to that point, we have a number of other projects that are either underway or completed um, that do have some relevance in, in today's climate and in building and enhancing that capacity, uh, including the um, AIM card partnership that we completed in uh, December of 2019 with our local libraries, which provides all of our students access to physical and digital materials at any of the local public libraries using their district ID card or um, their ID number. Uh, certainly, as we've seen our schools physically close, students don't have access to those physical library resources. Um, so the timing really couldn't have been better for the launch of the AIM program to give them access to those public library resources without needing to get a card of their own, um, which is a barrier for some of our kids. Um, we're also working to bolster our ability, you know, to easily guide students, staff, and families to key resources uh, through implementation of a better single sign-on portal. Um, so we're working on that right now and also improving our ability to support remote delivery of Windows applications, things like Autodesk and Photoshop uh, to Chromebooks directly. Um, then beyond that, I did want to mention, I don't have it on the slide, but our data team has been working uh, hard over the last few weeks in particular to develop data collection instruments, uh, repository capacity and reporting capabilities to support our return to learn efforts, um, both in advance of those in terms of needs assessment data that's important for planning, uh, as well as during implementation of the, the program itself in the fall. So uh, that's my quick overview. Thanks, Adam. And so uh, Les uh, said he let us off and I'm going to finish up with our, our last part of uh, transportation before we open to the board for questions. And first, just a, a large shout out to Esme Davis. She is our transportation manager and, and runs the day to day for us. It does just a, an amazing job. But I told her I would I'd give a brief update this evening. You can see there that uh, on a daily basis, uh, we transport nearly 5000 students um, on our 85 buses using just over 80 routes. And there's a little bit of a breakdown in the different uh, services that we provide, but I really wanted to touch on just three things that, uh, that uh, happened over, over the last year. The first being almost a year ago when we changed um, providers and went with Iowa Central. Um, a lot of people might not know because the transition was actually very seamless and we have a great partnership uh, with our local provider um, in Iowa Central as they provide um, the, the transportation services in concert with our administrative team on the inside. And so they took over the contract in July of 2019 and provided those services for the last year. We also moved to an online um, or an online driver training in the winter of 2019. We do have requirements that before individuals transport students that they go through um, a, a driver's training program. And we were able to make the switch from in-person to online. It is more accessible now. It provides a more efficient and in some aspects a more effective way to get training to uh, staff members that, that need it. And also provides an opportunity for retraining in short order if there are areas where you believe folks need to have a refresher on um, maybe winter driving before we get to the winter session. And so that was something that we were very um, happy to introduce over the course of the last year. And the third thing is something that um, happened in the legislative session last year and went into effect um, last fall. And that was a new Iowa school bus law that, or a new Iowa law, excuse me, requiring seat buses, requiring seat belts on school buses, talking too quickly. Um, the law went into effect at the beginning of October. The, uh, the good news for us from a cost standpoint was it only applied to new school buses bought after October 2nd. We had purchased new buses or Iowa Central had purchased new buses last summer before that date. And so given the way the law was written, we didn't have to retrofit any of those buses with seatbelts, but as we would um, see those school buses reach the end of their usability cycle, we will have to replace them with school buses that are equipped 
with seat belts. And so that uh, will generate um, you know, some, some conversations for us with Iowa Central as we move forward in terms of capacity, in terms of cost. But uh, those are our conversations that are hopefully um, a couple years down the road, but I think it is important to point that out um, to the board. And the last thing I'll mention in terms of conversation and looking down the road with transportation is how this is a large piece of what we're looking at when we continue, uh, consider our climate action plan and, and changes. If you remember, the board was provided a overview of that in December. And actually there is another topic on the board agenda tonight that is somewhat um, related to our, our climate action plan and transportation services is there as well as we know that um, our, our bus fleet and um, is our second highest producer um, towards our, our carbon footprint. And so we're already exploring ways with Iowa Central that we can reduce um, our carbon output. And, and of course that will be a major component of that plan as we move it forward. Uh, at this point, we are gonna open up to, to questions uh, from the board. But before that, I just want to, um, you know, uh, first say thank you to the board's support for all the work that we've done on the operations side. Um, a lot packed into those slides and even more packed into that report. And, and hopefully you can tell the, the passion that our team brings to that and all the great things uh, that we want to share. But, um, you know, we love this work and, and we love what we're able to do from our seats uh, to support the teaching and learning that's, that's going on inside our classrooms. And while our 330 employees might not uh, teach class, um, I can guarantee you, each and every one of them is committed to seeing our students succeed. And we come and approach our work with that mindset every day. And so uh, we just really appreciate your support, our colleagues on the teaching and learning side collaboration, as we do our best to support all the learning that's taking place in the district. And with that, we'll open up to questions. Thanks, Chase. Um, let me just say a couple things before opening up for questions from directors. Um, thanks to you and Les and Jeremy and Nick and Allison, Adam, Dwayne, Esme. Um, uh, I've led operations teams for years. I've worked on operations teams for years. And I can tell you that operations folks are almost always unsung heroes because you make it work, whatever the conditions, whatever is thrown at you, whatever, can, whatever happens, whether it's a crazy pandemic that no one anticipated to the seatbelt change that you were just describing, Chase, or, or you name it. And those last comments that you made, um, I wanna echo that, that, the, that the operations team members, um, all of the folks in the district that, that support um, students through their operational activities, in my mind, are not unsung heroes. They are heroes because they enable learning to happen because of facilities and, and bus transportation. And um, HR has brought in great teachers with good benefits and the financials are in strong situations and we've got fin good food and, and on and on and on. And so I just wanna say thank you. I get it. I, I know what it's like to be on the operation side. Um, and as I said, in my mind, you are loudly sung heroes. Um, and I just want to express my deep appreciation for what you do to help teaching and learning and help our students be successful. So um, directors, questions for Chase and team tonight, uh, things you'd like to put on the table for them. Uh, Janet, if you don't mind, um, <clears throat> again, I want to uh, really express my admiration with the operations team. Um, it's an outstanding work in, in all the divisions. I would like to ask Chase about the uh, school bus seatbelt. Uh, have we uh, done an evaluation of some kind about whether or not there's a, uh, uh, a student safety uh, rationale for uh, looking at equip equipping some or all of the current buses with seatbelts? Uh, well, the short answer, Charlie, is no, we, we have not done that analysis. Uh, I will tell you that the law was not without some controversy. Uh, there is research, like with most, most things on both sides, about the benefits of, of seat belts on school buses. Uh, but given where we were and given what we've been told, uh, information from not only our provider, but looking at information from the National uh, Transportation Board, um, we don't believe 
at this point, there is a need to move any quicker than what the law is saying in terms of equipping our school buses with, with seatbelts. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. I mostly want some uh, clarification. Um, I think a lot of us after our, the beginning of this meeting are gonna kind of look at uh, the staff and the hiring of staff of color. And I, I kinda, I'm looking at, uh, it's page 17 of the full report, but it's the, the number that's reported there with the 38% of the elementary classroom teachers that were hired in like December, January um, for minority candidates. Were those folks that are part of the 1920 numbers or they were hired to start next year? There, we hired some employees in December and they began in January due to classroom size. So they'll be, what well, they'll probably report out in the next year's um, data in there. So they started teaching for us uh, shortly after winter break when we added some sections there. So, is, so they wouldn't actually appear probably in some of those larger statistics because we use picture day um, data. So I was just highlighting uh, some hiring that occurred mid-year that isn't typical for us, but it actually turned into a very adv advantageous time for us to bring on some quality um, staff members, new teachers primarily, new to the profession since it was the middle of the year. Okay, I guess that was kind of led to my next, my second question then. So the there's a little chart right above it, right, with uh, new teacher demographics year by year, and it has a 1920 year. So does that 11% uh, uh, diverse can or diverse teachers um, include that 38% or it does not? No, it wouldn't include them at this time. Okay. Because I, my, I guess, Seeing a 38%, I mean, that's a, that's a good number. I really appreciate that. And then seeing a, a, an end number of 11 was a little concerning that we, that makes me think we started pretty bad. If it's not included in there, that's one thing. But I, yep. I think we're gonna see that we've been, with all of the effort we've put into it, right? We've been pretty static. And I do really want to um, get moving on the, on the grow your own. And I understand that this year kind of put a halt on virtually everything. I, I, I totally get it. Um, but that we can't stop that work. Um, I think that, you know, many things have been talked about over the last 10 days of things that we could do as a school district. I think one of the biggest things we can do is make our staff look like our students. And I, I can't stress it enough how important that is. So um, just kind of looking at those numbers, I, I, I like to see that 38% number it's way better than the seven and the 11 and the nine that are kind of all over the place, right? So whatever we did there, we need to keep doing it. And then once we have those teachers here, I think this has been a point that has been brought up over the last few years, we have to support them and make sure that they want to stay here and feel welcome here because I want to welcome them here and keep them feeling that welcome, right? It can't just be at the beginning, thanks for coming in now you know, go be a black teacher and teach all the black kids, right? That's not going to help anything. We have to say, come here. We want you here. We recognize the positive impact you will have on all of our students. And what do you need from us to realize that potential? So grow your own, get them in here, keep them in here and tell me what I can do to help support that. And I will do it. I'd add one thing to that, uh, Sean, just to follow up is, you know, I, I also feel really positive about our spring hiring. Uh, we've done a nice job. We've kind of worked on our practices. We've had to a little bit because of, um, you know, kind of the COVID situation, but also our building. So I feel really good about where we've been at this spring thus far, and hopefully we can continue to have that. One challenge we are facing is because we are making some great progress, and I think we are beginning some conversations and sharing some things, and we've ran into some roadblocks and also some challenges of folks not necessarily wanting to relocate as much. If you were to look at our applicant pool right now, it's very much people who live in a very small radius around the area just because of what's going on and people aren't thinking, hey, this is a good time to move. Um, so uh, we, we had some great progress to get going. We'll see where uh, the remainder of our hires go from here. Um, but thank you for uh, looking at that information. And that's a high priority for all of us as well. 
Sean, I would add, um, ask, you know, what you could do to help. And you talked about the retention side, but I think one thing that our, our board members and anybody in the community could do right now that would be helpful on this is to reach out to our state legislators. They're considering a bill right now that would be very, very helpful for us in recruitment of um, black teachers and, and other diverse teachers to come to the state. Uh, Jeremy gave you the statistics of teachers of color in the state. And so we know we're gonna have to change our recruiting practices. One of the bills that the, that the state is currently considering would make that a more efficient practice for teachers to come to Iowa if they're licensed somewhere else. And so I think that anybody that, uh, you know, that is one thing that we can all do is say, hey, look, if we're gonna recruit other people that come here, we need to make the playing field fair and even and respect the, the degree, the license they're bringing from other state to us. And so that's something right now that's being considered. And I, I, think, I believe it will have a positive impact on our ability to recruit diverse candidates to the organization, uh, both teachers and administrators. I just wanted to say that I certainly support Sean's uh, uh, statements here. Uh, um, and I do appreciate very much the work that uh, uh, Nick and Chase and others are doing in, in your recruitment efforts. And I have a question about um, technology. Are all of our classrooms uh, now equipped with the microphones for the teachers to use or only select? Um, we are very close. We had hoped to finish up this summer, but due to the uncertainty with SAVE funding, we won't be doing that. But at this point, I believe we have 22 of our buildings that are done or will be done by the end of the summer, and that, that leaves five left to go. Those are all elementary schools that remain. And then the follow-up to that would be um, kind of following up with what the community commenter had today. If there was a classroom that needed the amplified mic put in it, and maybe you can, it's not in the entire school there, would you be able to add like that one? Is that something yes. that would be possible? Yes, and we've actually done that already in cases where buildings didn't have that already integrated in their, uh, in their classrooms. Thank you. So uh, Adam, I'd like to follow up too with a question about internet access. Uh, I was working with the family uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, actually residing in Forest View, who uh, were not able to get access from, or their, their access to uh, Mediacom was, uh, uh, <clears throat> hadn't been, had not been completed. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess I would just say that I hope we're, we're making all the efforts we can make with Mediacom, which I believe is the only an access provider that we actually have uh, available to us all to uh, so that uh, requests for services to individual locations are processed by them with the same diligence and uh, uh, want, wanting to complete the request that I'm sure uh, your staff uh, exudes. Yeah, and I can just speak to that briefly. We, we have been um, following up to every extent that we can with Mediacom, and for the most part, it's been pretty effective. You know, we've completed hundreds of installations with them that have gone well. Uh, we've definitely had a few cases where we had communication issues and things fell through the cracks, mostly involving addresses that were misclassified in Mediacom's database or ours. Um, and at this point, I think that we've addressed at least all of the individual issues that I'm aware of, either by coordinating with Mediacom to get that service in place or by providing hot cellular hotspots to families who, to whom Mediacom has been unable to deliver service. So if, if there are exceptions to that, please let me know um, and I can follow up on those individual circumstances. But at this point, I think other than requests that have been submitted within the last uh, week or so, we should be pretty well caught up. Okay, thank you. Charlie, I would just add, this is Amy, hi. Yeah. Um, if it's the family that we discussed earlier, I'm pretty certain that Adam's team has gotten them a hotspot now. Okay, thanks very much, I appreciate that. 
Um, I don't have any questions. Um, I appreciate everyone's comments, but I did just want to thank you for the report. I thought it was laid out really well. It was very informative. Um, and, and I appreciated all the information and the updates. Let's can, and maybe um, Dwayne, can you guys just reiterate again what the savings were on the geo bond since we accelerated it? Um, and I'd also like to make the comment that it's nice to see the savings, but also that um, one of the biggest pushbacks when we were trying to pass this was that everyone, that was not everyone, but a lot of people that were on the no side said that we were not going to be able to do this uh, large of a project and stay on budget or under budget. And uh, not only did you guys do that, but we were able to save money too. So could you just, if you know at the top of your head what the savings were on that again? Uh, Paul, I don't have a specific number. Uh, I believe it was in the neighborhood of $10 million. And some of that was uh, a combination of inflation savings in terms of accelerating the projects and not uh, getting that 6 to 8% construction inflation that ha generally happens every single year. And the other was uh, taking advantage of some interest rate savings on actually the borrowing. So it was a combination of those two numbers, but 10 million is the amount that kind of sticks in my mind without doing the research into the detailed schedules. I, um, I had a couple more thoughts. I, I should have led with, you know, my, my thanks. I kind of jumped all over the one thing that I really wanted to talk about and forgot to, you know, thank you all for all your hard work because I, this, uh, you know, the last three months have been particularly tough uh, from an operations side. I can imagine how, how difficult that was. Um, some of the highlights that I really think are cool, I think the, the AIM card thing is a wonderful uh, addition for our district. Um, I, I've talked to a few people who, you know, they pop on the different uh, library websites and can zip uh, books right to their kids, uh, you know, devices or something so they can have, you know, books that they can have on their e-readers. And then if that one library doesn't offer it, they can jump to another one, it's pretty awesome. Um, the, the grounds work is uh, amazing, but I really want to single out our, our nutrition services. I know that uh, getting all those meals out to all those families and just the, the change in numbers from the, you know, when we started in uh, I don't know, late March or middle March, I don't even know what it was now, um, to the end of the year was astounding and transitioning that to, um, you know, our summer program. And I don't know what fall will bring, but I assume we will work out all those kinks too. So I didn't want to just jump all over something and, and not offer my thanks to everyone that has done just fantastic work this spring. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from directors or any other comments uh, chase from you or your team no just again thank you for letting us uh, have the floor tonight and to, and to share with you um, you know I couldn't be prouder to be a part of this team and and just really appreciate the effort of our of our staff each and every day and then a big thank you to the board um, for your support over the last um, three months the, the pandemic pay for these folks that, that were out there they're doing this work every day was was tremendously appreciated and um, so just thank you for your continued support and, and belief in the work that we're doing. Thanks, Chase. Thanks, folks. Appreciate the updates tonight. Really, really, really well done. Um, we'll move to um, our next uh, section of our agenda, which is the discussion items. First up is Superintendent Directions 3JC. Um, and uh, Amy, are you going to lead us through that? Sure, I can do that. Thank you, Janet, and good evening, everyone. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we were keeping the discussion alive related to elementary class size. It's been a few weeks since we've last discussed this. And last week, we um, brought this idea or this proposal to the Policy and Governance Committee. And during that time, as we reviewed it or talked through it, it was determined that we should bring it to the board for discussion tonight. And then for um, consideration of if you were in agreement to this for possible action um, at the following meeting. So there's four documents that were supplied, um, two which are currently being used and then two that are uh, being proposed. So two of the documents are the superintendent directions themselves. 
and the one superintendent directions 3J6 would show uh, the current RAM or the RAM that we operated off of this past school year, as well as the RAM model that we staffed going into next school year. We had to have a staffing model in place and we, um, we did that. In addition to that, then you can see how it plays out with the two RAM documents um, that were proposed. Sorry, I missed the other piece. The superintendent directions 3J6 that's labeled kindergarten changes would be uh, what we would propose then. I mean, the difference between those two documents is really uh, bringing K into its own column. And what we're not, we didn't propose changing K numbers in the RAM 1 or RAM 2 schools. Uh, RAM 3, we actually kept the same as well. But we proposed then that the RAM 4 and 5 schools keep kindergarten class size at the same um, that you'd see happening at the RAM 3 level. So that's the difference between those two documents. And then how that actually plays out with the overall FTE is as follows. So this is a little bit confusing, um, but just from the get-go, I continue to share that we currently, or we left off uh, this school year with 359 elementary classroom FTE. And, and you don't see that number necessarily represented in any of those columns. And that's because the data that we used um, from this past school year was that October 1st student enrollment data. So while the student enrollment data was accurate as of 10-1, with that school snapshot day, if we were perfectly staffed that day, um, I think you'd see us with 363 teachers. So that's, that's, we weren't perfectly staffed that day, but you heard Nick say that, you know, at some point during the year, we did um, add a few staff members. Anyway, we're, we're truly at 359, and that's not reflected in either of those RAM documents. So we're at 359, but the model we staffed on based on this kind of old RAM, quote unquote old, because we've only really lived in this RAM 5 model this past year, um, yielded 357 teachers. And I know that we've, uh, heard from staff as well as um, parents this year about kindergarten class sizes, particularly in RAM level five. So in this new proposal, we would take um, those RAM four and five buildings to at least that RAM three. And then what that generated um, was 362 FTE. So while it looks like we're up five, we are actually would only be up three FTE. That fills um, budget friendly, uh, given the climate, the budget climate that we're in. And um, with that, I guess we'd entertain questions or allow for, you know, discussion amongst the board members. Amy, just to clarify, um, at PNG, uh, I wrote this down, so please tell me if I wrote it down wrong, but I was under the impression that you were going to go to 20 in RAM 1, 22 in RAM 2, and then 24 in the other three RAM sections. Um, no, that, that was something we were considering. Sorry if you heard that differently. Say that, say that one more time, Paul. You thought we we're going to go to, to 20, 22, and 24? I, th I think he's right. I think it's, you know, 20 is the top for the RAM 1. Right. That's why it says a less than 21. Yeah, right. and that's accurate. So if that's you hit 21, you would flip to the next one. So 20 right. is the cap, and then 22. Yep. I think that's correct. Yeah, so in the new sheet that's been designed, the superintendent directions with the proposed kindergarten changes, it is reflected that way. Sorry, Paul, I had, yes. That's all right. I um, would suggest possibly changing it to those numbers because I think when people look at this, they'll just look and see 21, 23, 25, 25, and that's the assumption that they will go off of regardless of what symbol's in front of it, just like I did there. Um, it's just, I think it's easier. People will reference this document a lot. Um, and it's kind of similar to what, what you have in the far to right column. Sure. You could change to less than or equal to then might be one way to do that. So Amy, just so that I am tracking what you're telling us, if we make the proposed kindergarten changes outlined in the document to four and five to bring them down to 25 or 24, whatever we're gonna take, mm -hmm. only require three FTE hires Correct. And I would just say that with a big caveat that that's based on um, what we saw in student enrollment on March 27th. So 
you know, maybe um, we get a spike in enrollment um, numbers and what we've typically done is just added based on what the formula is suggesting. Now, we could also see the flip happen in the, um, the climate that we're in right now, right? We, we, we lose students because of the pandemic. Um, so it's really, I think our enrollment and every year from the time we staff in the spring to the time um, school starts on August 23rd or ever August 24th, you know, it's always your best crystal ball. So we've um, felt in past years that we could stay um, fairly true to whatever the superintendent directions were suggesting where, where they suggested we needed to be. I think that we're going to have to have a lot of discussion and continue to monitor enrollment super carefully um, when you talk about adding additional FTE besides uh, where we come to some agreement today. I'm curious for the members of the PNG committee, um, is this sort of a, are, are you unanimously recommending this change? I mean, I'm sure y'all spent quite a bit of time talking through this. I'm just curious, is, or, or were there points of view that were very well, I'm just curious the inputs from the committee members. Well, I, I would say that we didn't spend a huge amount of time talking about it, but uh, I wanted to make sure we got it out here, as Amy said, uh, for everybody here to talk about it uh, in hopes that we could take action sooner than later if that's what we wanted to do. Um, my personal feeling on it is that it's an absolutely necessary step, it, but it's one of many steps we've got to take to get class sizes in all of our grade levels to places where we all want them, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a small um, change, but could have some serious impact for several students. So my personal feeling is I would totally uh, vote for it and um, in my head know that it's the first step towards uh, getting where we want to be. Um, but I, I won't speak for the other PNG because I think mostly we want, we talked about it and wanted to bring it out here for everybody, but I don't think we really threw out our personal opinions then. So I'll let everybody else speak. Yeah, I agree with everything Sean said. We did not um, have a long dialogue about what our opinions were. Um, it was mainly to get this in front of the entire board so we can have that conversation and make sure that this was on the right track, knowing that this is the first step in something that is important um, for us to get in front of our community as soon as possible, because we know some of the concerns um, that have been expressed from families regarding our kindergarten classroom sizes. Uh, I'll also just uh, add that I am in support of this. Uh, it's uh, getting closer to the magic number of 16 that I keep being told by certain kindergarten teachers. Uh, that, that's the goal. And I don't, I mean, I'm just saying, I hear that a lot. Um, but the, uh, I, I like that it's going down. Uh, we're trying to make um, a dent in that and, and work with the dollars that we do have available, knowing that there are other things that we need to address as well. Um, and I think uh, Ruthina and Sean both said, you know, it kind of addresses the concerns from the uh, families, but also the staff, because that's who we heard a lot from uh, as well, which is different than what we usually hear, um, because a lot of times we only hear from parents. And this was really a cry from the staff to us you know, to help them out um, because it was needed. So uh, any change down, I think is a positive. So if this is what we can do right now, then I'm definitely for it. Thanks, Paul and Sean and Ruthina. I would, again, just looking for context from the conversation at PNG, I also am happy to see this moving in the right direction. Um, understanding that this can't be where we stop, but it is one step as y'all have said, and it is reflective of the budget scenario that we're in and it feels manageable. At least that's the message that I was taking from Amy's comments earlier too. So um, um, I, I, uh, I think this is a good step to take too and, and would support this as an action item next week. But other directors, comments, questions? I'd support it as an action item too. Uh, uh, Paul, in your view, does this, you think the staff at least understands that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> All the compromises that uh, you know that have gone into this, and uh, while they may not be really you know satisfied with the final numbers, they're at least supportive of the process. 
you know, that was, that's been, that we've been following to get to this place. Yeah, um, Charlie, I can say that um, after it was presented to us last week, I did reach out to one of the teachers that um, was one of the ones that reached out to us last year, uh, a classroom that I had visited, um, and let her know what the numbers were going to look like. And she was actually very happy um, to see that move. And, um, you know, that would, it's taking for her class, for example, was at 20, um, high 20s. Uh, 29 maybe she might have been at the or 28 is what she had last year um, taking four students out of that doesn't seem like it's a lot but four students is a lot um, so that's a, you know it's not uh, down farther but you know what 24 puts that classroom at the, probably the uh, and Sean can add to this I think he visited too you know that's uh, at least puts every kid's coat in the room and not out in the hallway so you know there's space there for him too great okay thank you yeah, I certainly um, support this. And I, you know, if we're going to start somewhere and make a dent, I think probably your your most important year of school is kindergarten. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad we're starting there. And I'm really happy that this is manageable. And I, I, I think this is smart to kind of flatten out kindergarten uh, in the in the in the top three tiers of RAM. Any other comments? Thanks to the PNG committee. Super, super good work. Really, really. I know you put a ton of time and energy into a whole bunch of conversations, but this is really solid. Appreciate uh, bringing it forward today. And we'll make sure we are in agenda setting that we get this on an action item for next board meeting. So I'm going to move on to our next topic, um, which is the return to learn update. Is that uh, Steve? Or Matt, Amy? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here, Janet. So thank Sorry, you. I couldn't get off mute there. Steve, did you have anything you wanted to open? No, I just, uh, maybe just one quick one, uh, which is, uh, and I know uh, we talked about it a little bit, but you know, as we say, uh, this is just a great opportunity um, to say thank you uh, to this team um, for the uh, uh, commendable work that they did wrapping up our continuous learning model uh, and closing that school year out. They've shifted seamlessly and returned to learning. Uh, piece, uh, gathering resources from not only our district, but uh, we're reaching out to the, uh, the metro area soups, Matt and I were on a call with them today, um, reaching out to the UEN, uh, trying to make sure that uh, we understand where other districts are going so that we've got the opportunity not only to draw the expertise of our team, but um, really to make sure that uh, we're accessing uh, that expertise from um, across the state and beyond our borders. So uh, just kudos to the team. It, it's better to, to watch them work. Well, thanks for that, Steve. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you for your comments at the beginning of the meeting and the focus on that. I, I think as we've uh, been preparing and uh, planned in the last two or three months, you know, we've we've handled this pandemic of COVID-19, but um, I think some of the um, pieces I've seen that have really appealed to, to me and, um, you know, informed my thinking or uh, commitment to the work is make of racism and how it happens in our systems and some of the systemic improvements we need to take that way. So I want you to know, you know, while we're heavily engaged in this work around return to learn, uh, we are also heavily engaged in trying to um, identify work to move forward, uh, uh, making sure we're reaffirming the commitment to that inclusion plan and that, that we don't lose sight of those things, that this has to be our work. I remember presenting that plan to you guys and this, that needs to be the work we do. It has to be the work we do. That's what our system has to have for change um, if we're gonna affect outcomes for kids. Um, and it, it's just a piece that has to be front of mind for us as we go on. So it doesn't matter how, how much other stuff we have going on or how many other plans we have working on, that has to have urgency around it. And I want you to know we are committed to that. And we, we have felt that urgency again. Um, and so uh, we'll continue to uh, plan, prepare. We're trying to spend a lot of time listening right now, I guess is one thing I would say. Um, you know, for me, it would feel a, a little irresponsible just to jump into that return to learn plan, knowing the conversations we've had the last week or two internally as well. And so that's why I'm talking about this a little bit, but uh, we're trying to spend a lot of time listening to the folks on our staff um, and to the, to the community and to some of those things we're hearing. And so, um, 
you know, I think that's a, that's a piece we'll continue to come back to. I, I know we're committed to coming back to it and uh, trying to identify how we done uh, or not to, not to just try to rest on the things we say we're doing, but we have to do more. I think that's the bottom line, right? We have to continue to look for places to do more and do better um, in that regard um, because that's what our kids deserve. And so I just wanted to say thank you for those comments at the beginning and, and the special focus on that. And, um, you know, the same thing you guys said, we know that black lives matter. We, we our, our black students' lives matter um, and that we really wanna uh, make sure they, they hear us and see us. And so we're gonna take some steps to do that actively. In, uh, in the return to learn uh, planning portion of uh, our agenda tonight, uh, what I wanted to draw your attention to first is a survey we put out uh, here uh, right before the board meeting, uh, we felt uh, it was time to get some feedback from the community uh, to help inform our return to learn plans. You've heard me talk a lot about the three different models of plans that we have to account for around the required continuous learning, the, the fully online piece at home, what an on-site delivery model would look like, knowing that it can't just be like it was uh, prior to March, that there's going to have to be some, some changes even in that on-site approach, and then what to do with the hybrid model. And so we have those three models we're trying to consider in those seven areas that we're going to give you an opportunity to hear from the leads uh, in those seven areas tonight so they can update you briefly on some of the work that they're engaged in. Uh, but we, we did feel the need to ask the community some questions about um, where they're feeling, um, where their stressors might be, what would be palatable to them, uh, what worked potentially, and, and where we need to improve. And so um, I think Kristen had sent a text here at about the one hour mark that we already had uh, 2,000 parent responses, and I think it was, uh, Kristen, what was it, 360 staff responses um, after an hour. Uh, so we felt really good about that, uh, just had putting that survey out and having that feedback back. But the other thing I would say is we know a survey doesn't reach everybody, right? Not everybody can access that the same way. And so uh, when Laura gives the, the equity update in her part tonight, she'll talk to you a little bit about Another approach we have to try to get some community feedback as well uh, that isn't just through the typical survey fashion because we think that has to happen in different uh, modalities a little bit uh, to give people a different opportunity to provide some of the things they're thinking or questions they might even have around the questions that we're asking. And so um, we feel good about those two outreach efforts. Um, I, I'm gonna give Amy or Chase a chance to jump in here too before we turn it over to the leads. but. Uh, the part that the, the three of us work on is the leadership component, which is the first one, and that involves developing a return to learn team. And so we've created those seven different teams in those areas. Uh, we work on that first team of leadership that then talks about a continuous improvement process. Uh, we meet with cabinet on Tuesdays and Thursdays every, every week uh, to uh, keep looking at our, our, our progress and update on our progress and to know uh, to keep this front of mind for us and, and keep it um, keep the work moving essentially around those three models uh, and then communication is a big portion of that first strand of leadership and so um, looking at ways we can better communicate in the fall uh, what was good about our communication this spring and and what do people need to know now and what do we need to hear back uh, from our community too is an important part of that of that first strand of around leadership and so um, it's, it's a lot, it's a heavy lift, uh, but at the same time, uh, we feel good about it when we talk to our colleagues too about where we're at in terms of progress or, or um, some of the, the plans they have going in the way we're trying to attack it uh, in that regard. Uh, we've spent a lot of time here initially on the continuous learning uh, piece since we, we know a little bit more about that one from just being in that environment, um, transition some to the onsite and then really trying to take that hybrid model once we have some more information to inform those decisions about what parameters for us might be, whether it's it's cost inhibitors or it's just things that don't work for families in our community. So um, we're trying to eat the elephant in a little different way and, and attack it as we can, um, but it, it's a big job and it's definitely taken a, um, a, great, a great team, uh, which we have uh, with all hands on deck. So with that, I, I would give it, um, if Amy or Chase have anything they wanna add, otherwise I think we'll work through the leads of those seven different areas and let them update you a little bit about what the what their team's considering and, and working through. Thanks, Matt. You did a great job of giving a uh, great overview there. I would just uh, say that one of the seven areas is leadership. Matt even gave a little bit of an overview that way, but we're really thinking about that district leadership team essentially as being the district cabinet. But from there, we've identified those cabinet members to take a lead on the other six areas. And then they've branched out and built their own teams. And so when you talk about um, just sheer number of people, 
Uh, there's a lot of people involved and sometimes our um, members of those teams are coming in and out depending on kind of what topic they're working on. And so you'll hear a little bit of that from them. So not only are we meeting biweekly, um, we are we have kind of staged the work. We're having them focus on continuous learning right now. Um, we're gonna we're about to pivot to thinking more about on site for a couple of weeks and then the hybrid. And I think you'll also hear from the teams that sometimes it's hard for them to splinter that out because they need to with the work groups focus on the conversation on all three because no matter what model we're in, their particular area calls for that conversation to happen that way. So just appreciate the work that's being done because not only are we calling them into those meetings twice a week, then they're going out and holding multiple meetings and sometimes having to identify further leads uh, depending on how elaborate uh, their area is. So I'll toss it over to Chase. The only thing I would add that uh, Amy and Matt didn't share is, I mean, we are appreciative for the, the collaborative approach, uh, both from everyone inside the organization and also some folks outside that are already uh, giving us some help as we work through this. And just um, as we try to balance that is this balance against time. Uh, time is not really our friend in this circumstance. Um, unfortunately, the calendar doesn't stop. And so August uh, 24th is going to come. And so uh, we're trying to make sure that, uh, that we, we address and, and hear all of the different ideas that are coming to us, but at the same time, we're continuing to try to move nimbly and nimbly yeah, and be agile as we move forward. Because once the plan's in place, um, you all were very complimentary of, of, the, of the work of the ops team over the last three months. We know the heavy lifting really begins and on the curriculum instruction side as well on the operations side. So once we have a plan identified, we do need to allow enough space for us to, um, to be able to, to put those words into action. And so that's gonna take some time before we get to the middle of August. And so we're trying to move as quickly as we can uh, to provide the public and our teachers and other staff members as much notice as possible, because then we really need to start putting these items into action. And that's gonna take us a couple weeks. And so uh, while we aren't trying to um, move too quickly, we do know that we need to be kind of very efficient with our work as we move through it this summer. That's probably enough from Matt, Amy, and I. Uh, the real stars of the show are the leads of our other teams. And so Matt, I will kick it back to you. Sure, so I think uh, what we'll start with some uh, is infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is the, the second category there, and that would be Nick and Adam are our leads. So I'll have them jump in here and, and talk about some of the work they're uh, participating in. Hello again. Uh, well, now we'll talk a little bit of a different topic, looking at infrastructure. And one thing that we found very early on as Adam and I were co-facilitating this is it's a pretty big, it's a, it's a big topic and there's a lot of things to it. So we ended up splitting ours into three uh, categories, which will help. And the survey that Matt mentioned early on, that is going to be so critical for our team to hear those voices from parents and staff members and others beyond our, our committee to help us inform some of the decisions uh, because we're really looking at a lot of the logistics that need to be in place for whatever plans we try to operate as we look at uh, continuous online learning we can or on-site learning or a hybrid model and what all needs to go into place. We have over 25 members that uh, work on our two different subcommittees and it seems like we're adding folks or finding reasons to add people at, all the time for their valuable insights. Um, we're looking at our three categories are basic needs, uh, organizational needs, and then professional development. Now, when we think about those, our, our basic needs category is basic needs in health, and we're looking uh, primarily at health and safety, uh, nutrition, transportation, and instructional support. And there always seems to be some other logistics that will fall into that. If you actually look at the return to learn plan that was provided by the state or the guidance provided by the state, many of these things weren't talked about in the great detail that probably need the attention. Uh, so we end up grabbing those and adding them to our team and, and figuring those out as we look at the different plans that are going to potentially exist this fall. Uh, organizational need uh, is looking at the calendar, attendance, uh, grading, all those different things that would need to be in place depending on our formats and our ability to move between those formats as needed. And then the final one, professional development. Within our group, it isn't necessarily determining what the learning or what the professional development needs to be, but more about the how. How is that going to happen 
depending on the format or the structure that we have in place for learning or where our staff is at or if some staff are on site or off site or what impact the schedule may have on professional learning. So we, we're really looking at that how portion. And I'll toss it over to Adam now to add any more that he'd like to in the overview and then he's got kind of a recommendation they wanted to share. Thanks, Nick. Um, you know, with all of the category groups in this return to learn planning, there are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of chicken egg questions in terms of, you know, how do you determine this in order to determine that? And so we've really worked within our, th our three subgroups to prioritize some key decisions uh, that, that we think can serve as a foundation for the rest of the work of our group, as well as for the other return to learn planning groups. And even though we're early on in the process, one of the things that we did tackle early on with, with our committee um, was the calendar and looking at calendar changes. The state has authorized um, certain flexibilities that have never, uh, that have not previously um, been available to us. Um, but as we looked at what our needs are, as we look at what our academic team is working on, um, our, our key recommendation to serve as sort of a foundation is that our start and end dates for the 2020-2021 school year um, should remain consistent. So when we look at that August 24th start date um, and the duration of the school year as, as we planned, um, that's something that, that our committee is recommending that we, we keep consistent as we move into next year. So um, we know that there are a number of very important uh, components of this planning process. Um, we continue to prioritize some of those, but that's one of the first ones that we tackled. So I did want to share that tonight. That's what I had for the group. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, next, we have uh, the health and safety um, group that is working through the three models in the, in the category of health and safety. So Dwayne and Kate. All right. Good evening. I can share with you a little bit of the work that we are doing. Um, we're very fortunate. We have um, about 20 people on our committee made up of administrators, teachers, um, community members. We have somebody from Johnson County Public Health, um, Johnson County Emergency Management, as well as a local pediatrician that are working through these issues with us. Um, because of the amount of topics that we have to cover, we are needing to break into various committees as well. Our larger group is working on some general safety and um, for students and staff. So working through some uh, issues such as, you know, hand sanitizer, um, will we have that provided? Where will we have it provided and the cost associated with it? We're looking at uh, physical barriers, so um, whether we need to install physical barriers such as sneeze guards and partitions, um, particularly in areas where it might be difficult for individuals to remain at like at least six feet apart. So like your reception desk areas and such. Uh, we're having a discussion next week on face shields and masks. Um, should those be optional? Should they be required? Um, what is the effectiveness of each? Uh, we're inviting some ex experts to speak on that topic and also look at CDC recommendations. And we're also considering the age appropriateness of that as well as cost. Um, as we move through some of those general safety issues, then we'll start looking at um, other issues, other issues uh, regarding protocols to minimize shared use of classroom materials. Um, and then thinking through some so social distancing issues, such as how do we utilize shared spaces. So really looking at um, uh, greater distancing measures that are that may be appropriate for um, certain areas, um, assigning maybe stairwells or bathrooms to specific classrooms uh, to minimize foot traffic in areas. Thinking about playgrounds, um, the Iowa Department of Education has asked us to look at you know, whether those should be closed. Um, if not, how do we disinfect those areas um, between use? So that's just to kind of give you a flavor of some of the general safety areas, and there are many more, um, but we're also breaking into some subcommittees. And within those subcommittees, we're looking at facilities, so buildings and grounds, and just uh, some topics they're looking at are custodial staff PPE, appropriate cleaning supply needs um, for ongoing environmental surface cleaning. We're also looking at um, you know, providing education to custodial staff on 
cleaning high touch surfaces like water fountains, rails, doors, playgrounds, and restrooms. We're working with a nutrition services subcommittee and looking at kind of the, the hybrid model or on-site model when we, when we look, are looking to serve food, you know, do we need to look at prepackaged boxes or bags for each student um, instead of a buffet style type of meal? And then also looking at um, the communal space used for dining halls and, and look at if there's ways to stagger use and, and how can we clean and disinfect, and disinfect between use. There's a transportation subcommittee and um, with that, we're reviewing the Department of Ed guidelines for PPE on buses, protection devices for drivers, and then how do you clean, disinfect, and, and social distance on buses. We also are looking at health resources, so procedures that our health department school nurses would utilize. And then we have a committee that's also more geared towards the preschool, so the statewide voluntary preschool program for four-year-olds. So a lot going on. We have 20 folks and we probably have an additional 10 or 15 that have been invited then to provide their expertise on those subcommittees as well. I might, yeah, I might add, Kate, that we've already investigated uh, the availability and costs of masks and shields uh, so that we're not caught behind the eight ball when the time comes. We need to have those materials ready to go. Uh, and we've already started uh, with a local uh, fabricating firm to start building what we call sneeze guards for lack of a better word for those fle plexiglass shields that will go up uh, at front offices and things and such. Uh, so we've already started that. We're contemplating now if we're gonna install those with our own crafts or if we'll, it would be beneficial to hire somebody. Uh, right now, I think we have the staff that, could, that has the talent and the availability to do it. Uh, and I would add too that we have a couple nurses on the group and, and they have a big, will have a significant input in that Kate and I are relying heavily on a report from the University of Iowa on face shields and their effectiveness. And the question that was asked and talked about quite a bit today was with the use of face shields, will it reduce social distancing? In other words, can children be closer together if they're all wearing a mask as opposed to not having, or excuse me, a shield as opposed to wearing a mask. So those are the kind of questions we're, we're discussing as well. All right, uh, academic, Diane. Sure, it seems like the theme tonight is to um, create some subcommittees and divide the work a little bit. So we are following suit with that as well. We have three main subcommittees for the academic work. Um, I'm leading one, Scott Kibbe's leading one, and then Adam's leading another, so I'll let them talk about their areas. Um, for my area, we are working on the structure of what this should look like in a remote environment currently. Um, so really, how do we schedule classes? How do we schedule how much should be asynchronous? How much should be synchronous? Um, really considering equity in that as well. How do we reach the students who we struggled reaching this spring? Um, what, how do we work with new students? We're gonna have a whole host of kids who are brand new to the high school, brand new to the junior high setting. How do we work with them? How do we get materials in the hands of kids? So lots of different um, things that we're considering and we're putting plans into place with those. Um, combined on all three of our committees, we've got about 70 members. So we have lots of teachers, lots of staff members who have agreed to be on our committees. Had a group that met Sunday afternoon to, to tackle some of these. So. I um, really appreciate all the support that we're getting. Um, Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks for having me. Um, my subtopic is uh, by the state is called accelerated learning, which is a little scary because that sounds like you're pushing down on the gas uh, faster and, and moving the car faster. And I like to think of it as grade level learning. And so what we're asking folks to think about from a mindset is that we're gonna start fourth grade with fourth grade material and not start with the end of third grade. We know that stuff was lost at the end of last year and so not remediate, but have a mindset around 
folding that lost learning into all of fourth grade or whether that's math and algebra and geometry, that kind of thing as well. So um, we have formed a committee and we've got curriculum directors and teachers and they are super eager to do that work to look at the standards in their current grades and their current curricular areas and then look at what was missed and how can they fold that uh, into next year. And uh, you've heard a lot of people comment about how there's so much uncertainty. One thing that's nice about my subcommittee is there's no uncertainty there, but that no matter what style we're in, whether we're in blended or whether we're in completely online or whether we're in person, we need to do this work. We know that we lost uh, learning at the end of last year and we know we need to fold that in to this year's uh, academic work. So that's kind of an overview. Thanks guys. Uh, and then I'm going to jump in with the online learning. Oh yeah, I did that to you. I don't know what it is. Uh, you already got your chance to talk. And so I, I keep, <laughs> I did that to you this morning too. I apologize. Go That's ahead. All right. No problem. Um, so the, the subgroup that I'm overseeing is our online learning um, subgroup that's really focused on development of an online learning program that can support effective instruction. And it's really key that it can support that within a variety of models including those where all students are online, where students are online part of the time, or where some students are online um, based either on our model uh, option or on health needs of students um, or family members or family preference in general. So we know that we need to be responsive to a continuum of possibilities in terms of how an online program will be implemented. And that's something that's top of mind as we work through this. Um, our work is really being guided uh, by, uh, through uh, the use of a state template, which is actually required by the Department of Ed for us to uh, develop an online learning program. Um, the good news is that it's actually pretty good. It's a fairly comprehensive uh, document in terms of covering those questions that need to be addressed in development and implementation of a program, um, along with research focused both on effective online learning in general as well as um, online learning specifically during the COVID crisis. We know that we can learn quite a bit from schools and organizations that are already in this, especially in parts of the world um, where the school year is, is in progress right now. Um, as with others, we're sort of dividing and conquering. So our subgroup has subgroups, um, you know, really looking at the three areas, teacher and student expectations and communication with stakeholders, identification of delivery platforms and ensuring student access and then professional development. All right, now we got you. Thanks, Adam, appreciate that. Uh, and we have uh, Laura Gray and Lisa Glenn working on equity. Hello, everyone. Um, just like the other uh, categories. We have some subcommittees right now that are working um, with the other groups um, in order to kind of uh, help provide feedback and capture what's happening to bring it back to the larger group. But we're tasked with trying to figure out how to um, or to come up with the various models for our um, students who are categorized as at risk. So that's with the, you know, um, special needs and uh, our historically marginalized students, so on and so forth. And so um, that's uh, what our team is doing. We have a, a team uh, that has all types of um, teachers and coordinators and directors on it. Um, we have a great team. And uh, one of the things we're doing that uh, Matt had mentioned was uh, um, another layer to the survey uh, is trying to capture some other voices through community online check-in uh, circles. So it looks very different than a physical circle, but um, uh, the, what we have coming up is um, Thursday the 11th from 10.30 to 12. We're trying to target parents of special education students. Um, of course, any, any parents could really jump on, but we're just trying to really uh, specifically coin in um, Tuesday, June 16th, 3 to 4.30, we're going to target parents of students of color. Uh, Thursday, June 18th, 6 to 7.30 p.m., targeting parents of ELL students. Monday, June 22nd, uh, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., targeting just any parent. 
And we're asking three questions. So what did you see or hear regarding why some students access the learning or not? Um, what did you see or hear regarding potential barriers for our at-risk population? Um, which I may change that at risk to historically marginalized. I know that's kind of triggering for some folks, but that is how it's framed in the DE. So we were just trying to be uh, consistent with that. Um, and then what do you believe is important to provide an equitable educational experience for all students in the fall, given the pandemic and current global issues? So um, we're expecting that, uh, you know, anywhere between 40 to 60 parents probably sign up a night, um, but we have, uh, our circle partners, um, some are uh, um, teachers, some are uh, community members that work with our district in regards to circles that are going to help in breakout rooms uh, so that we can narrow it down and ask everyone those questions and then bring that feedback to the entire group. Lisa, did you want to chime in? Um, yeah, we, you know, we really think about the equity um, the equity portion of the plan kind of in two different layers. Um, it's a little bit different than the than the other groups of the um, that we have going within the plan, um, in that we specifically will have some equity related actions. Um, a lot of those actions will actually be planned within the other groups. Um, uh, some things we'll be planning within our group, but um, a lot of it, a lot of the planning will happen within other groups. Um, but a lot, a lot of what we're doing is actually sending representative in, representatives into the other groups um, to bring the voice um, of equity to the conversations that are happening in the infrastructure, health and safety, Iowa academic standards, and um, social emotional behavioral health groups, um, and surfacing those ideas that we will talk about within the equity group back into those conversations, those specific things that um, we have discussed. Because, uh, and I keep, we keep saying, and this is the theme that we want to make sure and talk about all the time, um, that equity is not something that we do. It's the way that we think about everything that we do um, and providing equitable access to um, the best opportunities for our students. So. Um, you know, it's just, you know, something that should be a, a constant conversation. So we, um, that's, I think that's going really well thinking about it that way. Um, and we do have a great team and just making sure that uh, we're just getting those people into the right places is what we're trying to do right now. Thanks, Laura and Lisa. And next we have social emotional behavior health and uh, Jeremy and Laura Daly are leading that work for us. Oh, yeah, um, good evening again, everyone. Uh, so working with the social emotional behavioral health group, um, it's myself, Laura, and then we have uh, Laura Gray and Nick that are providing support and uh, information from us from there, um, the subcommittees that, that they're leading. Um, as we've kind of worked through the process, uh, Laura and I have been able to meet with the learning services department um, gathered input from them, and then we tasked that group to go out and gather some more input from uh, the teachers and staff that they work with, as well as the community partners that that they work with. And now we've started to expand our our um, our circle into elementary teachers, getting some of our other specialty type areas, uh, pre K special education, um, and then tomorrow we're going to be meeting with uh, the members of, from the equity uh, committee that that are that were recommended for us and we're really looking forward to uh, interacting with them and getting some of their input but also bringing in some of our secondary administrators as well you know our goal was to try to get as much input from as many different sources uh, as we can because you know our social emotional behavioral health is not static it's very fluid and as many pieces of input information we're gonna have in our plan. And all of those are gonna be resources that we have at our disposal as we look to, um, number one, identify you know, what the needs are for students, staff, parents, um, and then how do we address those? And then what are our specific action uh, steps that we can take to make sure that we get those um, executed? For example, when we talk about our, our staff um, and you know, figuring out what, what are their needs, you know, we can, 
put out a survey. We can try to get some additional information. But, you know, what are some of the things anecdotally that our staff are talking about? Who are they going to be comfortable addressing, you know, face to face, whether it's myself, whether it's a building administrator? Um, and then how do we task those individuals with making sure that staff has access to the resources they need that, you know, we're developing and, and implementing the resources that they need? For example, our um, employee assistance program, you know, we can put that information out there, but there's no guarantee that someone's going to pick up the phone and make a call when that need arises. So, you know, what are some other proactive resources and comments and conversations that we can have with our staff so that they know what, what options and tools and resources are out there. Um, and then from a communication standpoint, again, just circling back to, to everything else is, you know, how are we communicating with staff, with students, with families, so that they know what resources are available. And I think, you know, it's come up a number of times tonight, getting the information in the hands of the people that need it the most is gonna be the hardest thing um, for us to do. So we have to make sure that, you know, again, we're working with the infrastructure team to, you know, how do we get that message out there to students and staff? How do we, or students and, and, and uh, families, how do we, you know, provide training for our staff looking at, you know, what type of mandatory or optional training we can have available for staff at the beginning of the school year. Um, so again, we just want to try to take that 360 degree approach um, you know, to, to trying to meet the, you know, the social emotional needs of everyone, because like I said before, we know we're going to need that um, flexibility. Obviously, we got into this situation because of the uh, pandemic, but now we look at some of the other social um, conversations that are going on. So now we know we need to look at those and offer different types of support, bringing some additional types of resources for our students, for our staff, because everyone is going through all of this together. Um, so we need to make sure that we're offering up as much resources as we can to make sure that we're supporting everyone's uh, needs and, and concerns. Uh, anything else, Laura? No, you. that was great, Jeremy. I don't really have anything else to add. You kind of covered it all. So I was, I was ready to jump in, but you got it. So thanks for that good report on behalf of our whole team. We've got some great members who are um, contributing, as Jeremy said, just various different perspectives, and we'll continue to do that. But um, nothing to add. I think that was a really good overview. I appreciate you doing that for us. Laura, um, and then the last one. Uh, so maybe there's, but we'll have Adam take that. One. Thank you. Um, the final group is data. Uh, that's one that we are we are working to address really the need for data collection, storage, and reporting um, in two key areas. One of them is needs assessment, so identifying what those needs are. You know, Nick mentioned uh, with the infrastructure group, for instance, getting survey results back is going to be critical as we do the work required in that group, and that's true across the group. So one of the things that we're doing, um, again, working from that state template uh, for return to learn, is identifying what data we need to collect, how that's going to be collected, whether we need to develop or identify a data collection instrument um, to use for that, uh, and then how it's going to be reported. So the needs assessment side, and then also, especially once we get into implementation in the fall, um, implementation monitoring and evaluation. We are potentially entering some uncharted waters here, and so the need for data to help inform our decision making, but also help um, provide us with as complete a perspective as possible on the effectiveness of what we're doing and the areas where potentially we may need to change what we're doing, I think is going to be critical. So um, at this point, we've identified uh, sort of pre preliminarily data that address the needs uh, listed in all of the categories that you've just heard from. Um, and we'll be providing those to the category leads, um, getting feedback from them regarding additions, revisions, or any additional specificity that can be added to our data lists. Um, and after that, we'll immediately begin the process of either identifying or developing those uh, collection instruments and procedures and reporting capabilities. Well, thanks there, team. Um, it's a total team effort, as you can see, and I know people are anxious to know what the fall is going to look like. We're anxious to know what the fall is going to look like. Um, but you can kind of, I think, uh, start to understand, appreciate the depth of the work from uh, hearing these guys talk about each of the, the subcommittees and all of the pieces that have to be accounted for in, in those three different uh, scenarios and models. And, uh, you know, I think 
we have um, good perspective on the, the size and scale of really actively working to try to get the appropriate feedback and voices into the conversation and into our uh, planning uh, mechanism. So I think from there, I know that was uh, yeah, being patient, let us get through that. But we wanted to give you that overview tonight. So if there's any questions, I know we'd be happy to take those as well. I'd like to just jump right in before I forget what's rattling around in my brain. Um, I want to say I appreciate all the, the thought going into the operation side, um, you know, all the physical things that have to happen. Um, but you guys all had your 15 minutes already today. So I'm going to go to the Return to Learn is the name of it, right? It's not Return to Our School Buildings, it's Return to Learning. Um, and I will say, you know, having watched my kids trying to do remote classes, I think schoolwork and learning it became very apparent that there's differences there, right? And so, I, one, I just want everybody just to kind of keep that word in their head that we've got to figure out how to get our kids learning again because they're all out of practice. Right. And so they're going to have to, you know, remember even how to do that. So, so um, welcome Scott to the team. A way to jump in to the deep end. Uh, we're going to not give you any shallow water there. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned with, I think Adam kind of mentioned efficacy of different things, but I, I'm, I don't know how we're going to easily measure our efficacy of teaching in this environment if it's remote or a blend or whatever, I don't know how um, like state assessments, like that's kind of a whole weird thing now. I don't know when it's going to happen or how that's gonna um, come into play, but I, I really wanna, I really just wanna keep everybody's focus on that, that learning portion and how we are going to ensure that kids are actually taking something away right like that's that's the charge here for you know all of you guys is that when the, the kids are done with school they are going to be uh you know great members of our society and can take away something that's going to help them be successful in our society and just checking off the boxes isn't necessarily going to get there so i just want i want that focus there and and i know you guys are thinking of it but i, I We've heard a lot, not just from you guys, but uh, people, you know, posting online and things like that. How are we going to get our kids separated from each other physically, or how are we going to make sure that they're, um, you know, not getting each other sick? All, all of the physical stuff. And I, I think the, the bigger point is how are we going to ensure that we are giving them the education that they deserve? And there's so much more to it than just learning too. And you talked about the social emotional type learning. Um, that's hard to do remotely, um, right? Interactions with people is very important. And if I could throw one last thought as the silver lining is I think this whole process across the state and the country will illustrate how important that relationship between a teacher and a student is. And I think we have to, you know, use that to our advantage as we advocate for funding and help for public education that we knew that teachers are the most important part and this is going to help illustrate that so i rambled a lot but um learn that's the word to remember thanks for that sean and i you know i think the you know amy is one of the ones i think pointed out to us first is that um you know really the the heavy chunk of the plan I, we think um and I shouldn't say any of them are light, but you know, it seems like there's a lot of parts of those seven parts that revolve around those three core areas of um, the academic standards, the equity component, and the social emotional behavior health. And then the other things, you know, there might be some some barriers that are identified in those other areas that you know limit our ability to develop a solution in one of those three big chunks. But those really need to be our drivers, right? And I think that's the point you're speaking to: is how do we focus on that learning piece and give the best learning experience possible? Because this is one shot. And make sure that this is, uh, you know, that there's urgency around that same thing around equity and social emotional behavior health. Jeremy did a great job of talking about how, um, the, you know, the focus of that has to be even wider than uh, maybe what we were planning for two weeks ago, um, you know, and, and some of that component. And so I think if you think about those three chunks and then how the other pieces support that, um, you know, another shout out to our operations group, you know, about, you know, trying to really wrap around with what the, um, with what the district tries to do in those areas. So 
I think that was well said and in, in a, in a definite focus of our work. Yeah, I agree with Sean very much. But I, I want to go back to uh, uh, when uh, Matt and uh, Kate, especially, when you were talking about the uh, the health aspects of what of what your team is charged with, um, I heard you say a few times that uh, you were considering both uh, measures that reduce transmission, as and and uh, looking at the cost of those measures. Uh, frankly, as a board member, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I would like you not to be thinking about cost at all, but to looking about how to looking solely at how to effectively reduce or eliminate transmission. Yeah, I think Charlie, that's that's difficult, right? Because I think we would li also like to, you know, think that cost isn't a factor, and there's no premium you can put on health and safety, and there's no number that makes sense. I think the cost one is considerations around um, consider things like busing. If we can only put 13 kids on a bus in the fall, that obviously affects what we can do um, and how that might look. And uh, transportation costs could be, you know, inordinate if we're only still putting 13 kids on a 77. 77 passenger bus. Um, and so I think it's trying to balance what are the guidance, the health and safety requirements, and then how does that affect the plans that we can make per se. Um, so I don't think it's as, you know, it's probably not as, I think there's some things, cleaning, disinfecting, you know, wearing face shields, things like that, that are easier for us to check off the box and say, you know, we'll, we'll figure out the resources we need to allocate for that. But then there's some bigger ones that are, that are just more difficult. Um, to also handle and then uh, cons consider how that gets implemented into the work. Well, if we can, <clears throat> if by putting uh, 26 kids on a bus instead of 13, the transmission rate goes up by 5% to me if we put 13 kids on the bus. I, th I think the point is we would need mm -hmm. twice as many buses or three times as many. I understand buses, that. Right? I understand yeah, that's more that's, costly, but, but yeah. you have lower transmission. You're right, you would. So, so and that's why the guidance is 13. And so I, I think that just, you know, then we're just going to get into consideration about, okay, if our transportation costs are um, going to increase considerably, then where does that come from and how do we handle all of those things? Well, so I think that's where they said, okay, if we're going to increase costs over here, then what does that mean? Um, you know, because there's not an unlimited pool of money, right? And so just trying to focus on all of those different competing aspects of what that might look like. And we don't know that that's going to for sure be the guidance in the fall either, but that's just one specific example. But I get the spirit of what you're saying. Definitely, Charlie. Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to comment. I am so impressed to hear uh, everything that's going on with the return to learn plan and how it's structured with the different departments and then the, the subcommittees on that. It is, it is clear how much work is going on and that it's really thoughtful work. And I know that everyone is busy, but I wonder if there is time to somehow add this to the COVID page on the district website so that the public can see um, what's being done. You know, like Kate, when you were talking about that you're consulting a pediatrician and, or not consulting, that there's a pediatrician on the committee and Johnson County Health. Um, I think that is just so essential for the public to know um, I think there's so much anxiety right around right now, not knowing what's going on in the school district and being concerned these plans aren't being thoughtful um, when it's clear that they are. And so if we can message that um, by either putting the names of the people on the committee on or their demographics, you know, five teachers, public health officials, some, something like that, so that we can communicate um, when people ask, well, what are they even doing? We can say, here are the thoughtful people that they're engaging to, to get this right. So that would be my um, one, just one of my requests. And then the other is um, there is a lot of anxiety and concern, and maybe this is just because where I am in my life and the group of people that I'm with, but with the elementary aged parents and childcare. Um, and I have already, I looked at the survey when it came out and so, um, I know, you know, one of the things that proposes is even an odd days and the, the thought that comes to the dual working parents home is how am I going to get my child care set up on a, on an alternate, even odd day. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, but I want to make sure that 
that people know that we are thinking about that. Um, and I would hope that we could talk to child care providers in the Iowa City area as soon as we have some idea of a resemblance so that maybe they can step up their child care options so that in, right now they're mostly structured 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours. But maybe if we talk to them early, they can restructure some plans so that it is odd day, even days to match up with the days that the kids um, aren't in school. And I, I think this is a particularly um, of particular concern for elementary age. I think that the secondary kids maybe are older and, and can do a better job watching themselves, um, but those kindergartners need a place to land. Um, and, and I'll just tell you that I've been watching a post on a parent group uh, on Facebook and there's already almost 40 comments in the last hour and a half about the survey that went out and how are we going to deal with childcare. So it is, it is a, pressing issue that I know we don't have answers for, but it, if, if we can reassure everybody that we are thinking of that, I think it would go a long way. Lisa, I appreciate those, those comments and um, I can't tell you that, that we are thinking about, about that as we go into that, but um, I appreciate that example because I think it ties back to one of the comments I made at the beginning is because that's one of the reasons that we know that we need to settle on an approach sooner rather than later. Um, not only can we not do it structurally or instructionally, we can't drop a plan on the community on August 15th to start nine days later. And, and so I hear that's what you're saying. And so do know that uh, we don't have all the answers to that tonight, but it is in our thought process. But we also wanted to be fair to the community and put out a variety of options. So to your other point, that they could see where we are, where we're thinking as we start to kind of funnel this to where we're gonna, where we're gonna end up. Um, and then can put out some of those pieces so we can start to explore some of the other things you're talking about of working with community partners on child care and other pieces that we know have to have the details worked out once the plan is actually settled. Yeah, the only thing I'd add there, really appreciate that too, Lisa, because any of those three options that are on there, you know, we know there's problems in each of those options, right, and difficulties about solving any of those things. And so they're not problem free. Uh, there's a there's a, there's a lot of you know issues that would have to be worked through those. And that childcare one is just huge. I mean, it's a huge component. It's it's definitely one. And and some of them, you know, based on not only the responses, but as we work through these things and continue talking about them, may not be viable for us. And so uh, Chase used that funnel example. We've talked about that one. We funneled some things out, right? Didn't even make it to the survey, but you know, those did, and uh, there may be things that we don't pursue, you know, following that for some of those, those very valid reasons. But, so thanks for sharing that, and also about the webpage, um, about who's working on it, and, and trying to tell uh, the community what work is, and we'll get to work on that. I have uh, one comment, first of all, thanks for all the work that you guys are putting into this, because uh, just listening to it, I imagine that this uh, takes up a vast majority of your time uh, in a time when you also have other things to do. Um, so I appreciate the work that's going into this. Um, I had three questions, um, two for you guys, one for our board. Um, you guys were talking about the number of teachers and staff. I think you said it was 70 on the group. And I just wanted to make sure that you had preschool and kindergarten teachers on there. Uh, because I think that's also a challenge, as I mentioned before, that first experience uh, coming into the district and uh, being on there. Uh, on If it's virtual, I mean, that's, I think, impossible, but I'm sure you guys will make it happen. Um, also, the um, uh, in regards to um, PD that you had talked about, um, I know it's, uh, I said this before, but I don't think teachers were ever trained to teach online. And so is there, a, and maybe I missed it, but is one of the groups talking about um, ways to help teachers that aren't comfortable in this realm of teaching um, to make sure that they're successful? Uh, I'll stop there so you can answer that. And then I have two more questions. Yeah, Paul, I can speak to that. The um, online learning group, the, the subgroup of the academic standards group that I'm leading, uh, probably our biggest category is professional development for teachers that'll be required um, 
you know, in the event that teachers are teaching online either all or part of the time. So that's, that's a major focus for us. Paul, the other thing I would just jump back to is um, Matt was alluding to some of the pillar areas. You know, when I think about professional development, there's um, the one thing I have shared with the larger team or cabinet um, from time to time is that there's really three big issues that are competing for time uh, for our staff. And that's, you know, we've got to bring them some information around health and safety and mitigation efforts. Certainly the social emotional behavioral piece um, and then the Iowa academic standards and how we're going to accelerate the learning and the online component. So there's just so much competing for our time and then how we're weaving, you know, equity into any of those conversations. So we recognize that we have so much to put in front of the staff. Our challenge is going to be how do we make it super meaningful knowing that there's um, those competing interests. And Paul, we do have a preschool rep on health and safety. Then yeah, those uh, transition one years, Paul, you mentioned kindergarten and preschool, but those transition years, I know it generate a lot of conversation because it's it's a big year uh, for students at those different levels going from sixth grade to seventh grade and eighth grade to high school. And then, like you said, you'd identified kindergarten and preschool, obviously, too, and how the difficulties with a virtual experience there. So very good thoughts. What was your other one there, Paul? Um, this is probably for maybe Chase and, and you, Matt. Um, uh, although we're talking about return to learn, I think some of our learning started already June 1st when some sports came back, because uh, I do believe that's part of learning in our schools. But uh, one concern that's been brought up to me is um, was restrooms. And I don't know how you guys could, were able to address that. Um, for example, West High's restrooms, I believe, for their sports facilities are inside the school building. Uh, at Liberty, I think you have concession stand restrooms. Um, at City High right now with softball, there aren't any restrooms because I believe they're all closed off. Um, and then at Mercer for City High Baseball, uh, from what I understood is that the city wouldn't let you use the restrooms that are there. Um, so basically what I'm getting is it sounds like there's probably a few um, porta potties that are going to have to be used. And if that's the case, I'm just curious on how um, that's going to work because it seems like a pretty high already germ -y area for a porta potty use and now it's um, even more of a concern. So can you address that part of it all? Sure. Uh, we have had uh, some challenges regarding uh, the restrooms at a couple of our locations. Um, you mentioned some of those, uh, both COVID and construction. Facilities is continuing to work with the um, admin, excuse me, the athletic directors at our schools, as well as the city at, at Mercer to see if we can't come to a compromise uh, to, to utilize the restrooms there. Um, we have also explored uh, using uh, porta potties uh, as either a backup or a place where we can't get those. Um, of course, we would um, clean those daily uh, because you're right, there is um, a, a health factor just alone with those. And so uh, we would try to minimize that as much as possible. But our first plan is um, to, to come up with a solution uh, to utilize more standard restrooms at all the locations. Again, our facilities team is uh, still working out some of the final details with the ADs at those sites. Uh, we know games are quickly approaching, uh, you know, starting June 15th. But um, we are making some progress on, on coming up with, uh, uh, with a solution in those areas. And then the, the last point is more for the board. Um, so, so far, everything we've heard has been school related and uh, return to learn. But um, one of the things that I would like to maybe talk about in the future um, session for us at some point is a um, return to learn as well, but learning in a different way. Um, some of our current committees, um, their work is going to slow down or it's gone away. Um, and uh, one thing that I would like us to think about is maybe coming up with a um, board development, um, again, uh, around um, equity and racial um, issues, um, similar to when we went through implicit bias training, um, just continuing that work so that we can continue to develop. develop. And then another thought that I had was um, one of the most powerful things that I think we can agree that we hear is when we go to things like uh, the education committee and we have students 
talk to us about their experiences. Um, I think that if we had a, a time, and I'm just totally making this up on the fly here, uh, where we even divide and conquer, maybe it's two, two um, board members at each high school, and we were able to sit down with a group of students um, without administration or teachers there, you know, if they're willing, and just to be able to listen and hear their experiences um, so that we know how we can help move forward um, with uh, some of the things that are going on. I, um, the protests that um, we're, we're seeing and hearing about, uh, I think JP or someone touched on it that they are former students of ours, you know, we're seeing that. Um, and I know like we've heard from some of them before when they were in school, but I would really like to hear those voices um, more throughout the year um, just to help us guide our work. So that was kind of me rambling about that part, but when we get back to business and our return to learn um, part of this, I, I would just like to expand that and hopefully we can make something happen in that area. Thanks for that, Paul. I think that's an excellent idea and I'm when we get together in July for a retreat on our working on our goals, that might be also a good time to talk about our regular committee structures and these kinds of ideas you put out around how do we find ways and opportunities for directors to listen to students and what their experiences are like because their worlds have been turned upside down like everybody else's and if we listen, get that that voice, um, it's it'll help us do our jobs more effectively. So let's think about that for a topic for our upcoming retreat in July. Other comments? I'll just put my voice in of thanks, Matt, to you and the team and honestly everybody. What I take away is that you're really carefully, carefully considering all the angles um, uh, for how what returning to learn looks like in these various scenarios and it, it, it's got to be an enormous amount of work and just want to thank you for the detail with which you're going through it and um, it's, 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 it's physical but it is the learning pieces and I know um, you're, you're listening to what we're offering tonight and we'll take that back into your work of the team. So thank you so much. It's a lot, it's a lot. Um, and I think you probably are feeling a little bit of the pressure of August 24th as well. Um, so just let us know what we can do to support you uh, in the process. And uh, we're here to do just that. Thanks, Jenna. Other comments on this? This was really helpful um, and very, very comprehensive. Um, I think we'll move on to our next I item, which is the uh, uh, the sol solar power purchase agreement discussion. And I think um, Steve Joe is on the call with us tonight. He is. Oh, uh, and uh, just a reminder that uh, in your uh, administrative content uh, on that section, uh, you have a memo that Attorney Holland provided. Uh, and uh, that is a privileged document. Uh, but as he shared, uh, if the board would like to uh, remove that privilege, uh, that would provide the opportunity to both post it publicly uh, and allow him uh, an expanded opportunity to share uh, thoughts and input uh, uh, with you on the content of that memo. So uh, I would recommend that uh, your first course of action would be just a short discussion on your willingness to waive privilege. Uh, and if so, then uh, we can open the, the floor up to Joe to both uh, walk through the memo and uh, go through Q&A with you. And uh, then I can also move that into the uh, public uh, segment of the uh, board docs. I'm on mute. Sorry, so I captured that correctly. The first thing we need, what we need to do tonight is to agree as a board to open this up for public view. Is there any yes, first is an interesting thing is waive waive privilege. So, I, yeah, it's, I don't think this is a vote, but I think we're just getting input from directors um, around um, waiving privilege. Is there anyone who disagrees with waiving privilege? Hearing none, I think we're good with that, Steve. Very good. I will make that move, and at this point in time, I will turn the floor over. Uh, to uh, Attorney Holland, and he can walk through the memo with you and uh, again, uh, provide an opportunity for you to uh, offer input. So Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. This started with a request from Steve, uh, which is largely fueled by a proposal submitted by Megawatt for a power purchase agreement. I know the 
the board and a lot of the community are interested in moving to solar power and in looking at the proposal for megawatt it brought up a number of issues some of which had come up in a little bit different context when the solar array was installed at liberty um, I don't know that I want to necessarily walk through every issue in this. I assume the board's all had an opportunity to read this, but I think the long and short of it is there are a lot of issues involved. It's a lot more complicated to make an assessment of what the district needs in terms of moving to solar power. Um, it's fine to have somebody submit a proposal, but remember they're trying to sell you something and it may be classically like the shoe salesman, it doesn't necessarily sell you the shoe that fits your foot. I think it's important that the district come up with a plan that meets the district's needs. And remember the, the megawatt proposal was for a 25 year agreement. And so you're looking at decisions that need to be durable in the district's interest that could go on a long, long time. Uh, I don't know that um, there's anybody locally who's really qualified to drill down into the various solar options that are out there, but I think it, I think it's important that the district look into the possibility of hiring a consultant. Uh, I looked around a little bit and unsurprisingly, a lot of those consultants are in the Southwest United States where they have a lot more sunny days than we have in Iowa. I don't know that you'd be able to find somebody regionally who's not trying to sell something. And I think that's one of the key components. I, I include in the materials the uh, uh, little summary of the RFP that's been put out by the Santa Barbara Unified School District in California, because I think it, it actually tracks reasonably well with kind of the model that Megawatt had with multiple buildings and multiple facilities. Um, so I, I know there are, uh, discussions out there and people who can and participate in these RFPs. So I think that's, that's probably um, uh, the starting point to really move into um, the district moving ahead. This indicated there are a number of sort of localized concerns about the buildings themselves and things like roof maintenance, uh, warranties on the roofs, what happens in the event of a fire, um, insurance, whether that'll increase insurance costs, because the goal of this is to be able to acquire electricity at below market rates from whoever would install the power purchase equipment. Uh, so all those other costs that are lingering out there need to be evaluated. Um, this is, thanks, Joe. Um, question um, for the district team. Aren't we required to go after competitive bids before we'd enter in, into agreement? of this nature or, or not? That's not necessarily, Janet, because this is not, this is not a district construction project. Okay. Right. It's a, it's a service project. So think about it more on the lines of like an architect. So they're providing a service for us and there's not a requirement for RFPs for service per se. And since it's not even that. What you're doing is leasing district property to private enterprise to install their equipment on district real estate. And they don't pay rent under the megawatt proposal. The, the, the economic attractiveness for the district is reduced costs for power. Uh, and also just to shift away from uh, fossil fuel generated power. You know, we, we don't need to set, put this out for competitive bidding. There would need to be uh, a public hearing at a minimum on uh, the idea of a long-term lease with a commercial vendor. So we're not, we're not compelled to go get competitive bids, but it's still probably not a bad idea in terms of looking at different options that people would propose to us. I think, I think it's a great idea. I think, and, and I th one of the reasons I think it would be a good idea for the district to craft its own uh, standards, what the district's looking for is so if you put an RFP, you're really getting an apples to apples comparison because right. Tell vendors to come in and tell you what they can offer. You'll get apples and oranges. We've, we've already seen a little bit of that. Um, so I think it's important not, not to say, what does somebody have to offer, but what does the district need? Now, you may be able to go to an architectural firm, and, and I, you probably need to have some care to make sure that people who sell themselves as consultants really have the credentials to do that. 
but architects may be a good source. Uh, Duane and the people through the physical plant may be able to tap into some sources of consultants. Uh, there are probably a variety of ways to do that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I generally support a, a competitive bid process um, a, around a set of requirements that be articulated in RFP, for example. Um, my question is around the need for a consultant and I, and I, and what I'm, I mean, I'm worried about additional expense, but also, um, and do we have, if we have some of these templates available to us from other uh, school districts and with our own internal staff and, and knowledge, is it possible for us to do this on our own? And, you know, do we have, I mean, I'm just, I'm asking the question, do, the, the consultant obviously would be someone who's steeped in this and can guide and advise. I just, I'm just trying to find out if that's a requirement or if we believe we have the internal team that could lead us through this process effectively. It's certainly not a requirement. I think that you'd get the internal team to think if they have the expertise. I think one way to look at it is a megawatts proposed a 25 year plan. And when you amortize the cost of a consultant over 25 years, it may be money well spent. Now I, I, I understand budgetary times now are full of uncertainties full of uh, stretches in every direction, particularly with, with the discussion I listened to about how do you return to learn and all the fiscal challenges inherent in that. Um, I think the, the, the downside is that if whatever happens doesn't meet the district's needs, you may be locked into a long-term deal with no ready way out of it and it may not meet the district's needs. And so you need to be really sure that whoever's writing the specs on this has the technical expertise uh, that can provide the district with the solutions it needs. And I think that's our real concern. We're just not sure we have that technical expertise on the staff. We know components of it, whether it's you know, the property pieces and the impact on things like warranties and the roof and, and those types of things, which Dwayne can certainly provide or um, assistance with the technical components of it, which Adam can provide. But when you start putting it all together and looking at some of the complexity that goes along with it, um, that's where we're just not sure we've got uh, the ability to write uh, an RFP for this kind of project simply because it's so far outside of our wheelhouse. Thanks, that's helpful. Other directors? Yeah, I'd, just, I'd jump in with, uh, you know, we, we have a climate action plan and, and, you know, we have a goal of reducing our re reliance on fossil fuels, right? So right. The, the end goal is to um, do that, not save money. Saving money would be great, but that's sort of the bonus. I think we're trying to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. I don't care if it's PPAs or we buy our own or we, I don't know, find a magic thing that gives us free energy somewhere I, you know whatever it is I don't care if if we have folks internally that can say hey these are probably our best options to get us to the goal of you know a lot of clean energy I'm all for it right I, I don't need to push PPAs I think the I think the importance of the PPA is if we wanted to do something quickly without a huge upfront cost, that's kind of one of the solutions we have to work with. But there are other options out there and I don't have a favorite. I just want to make sure that we're moving towards that goal of, you know, zero carbon footprint, right? Um, knowing that it's not going to happen tomorrow, but, you know, whatever those steps are and whatever the you know, our team, you know, Dwayne and his team can say, you know what, I think these are some great options, right? They've already done a lot, right? Making pretty green schools. So what's the next step? What's the next thing that is going to work the best for our district to keep going towards that goal? If it's a PPA, okay, we'll figure that out. If it's not, it's not. I don't, I don't particularly care on that aspect of it, but I wanna keep driving towards that goal. Yeah, and just to chime in on that, piece, uh, real quick, Dwayne, and I'll turn it over to you, is, is Sean's correct. I, mean, I know this conversation tonight is about PPA, but we have had other entities, Joe's mentioned one, that have reached out to us about ways that we can reduce our carbon footprint and, and be more green. And Mid America, who is our current energy provider, is one of those that has also brought an idea to the table. And so um, I, I don't mean to take us down a different path tonight. I just wanted to say, Sean, you're, you're, you're right. Um, this conversation is about PPAs, but there are other options that we can look at and consider as well. And I, and I think that we should. I think that we should look at all of the options on the table to achieve the goals that the board has set 
and, and where we want to move and how we do that swiftly. And I might add that, you know, we've already reduced some of the work of a potential consultant because we've already done a rough study and we've already looked at all the roofs in the district and determined which ones were viable and which ones were not, which ones we could maintain roofs on, which ones we can't. So I think that's a big piece of it. Uh, I do think, I, I do favor the RFP process, though, Janet, because I think it, it does create a more level playing field with all the vendors out there. And I guess from my perspective, I would request some assistance in writing that R RFP. I mean, between last night, we've written a lot of RFPs over the years and it's a matter of collecting the right information, but having some technical expertise to make sure that that RFP is appropriate, I think would be beneficial to the district in the long run. Thanks, Dwayne. Thanks, I mean, that's sort of what I was asking was do we have the, the 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 expertise to actually get those specs in the RFP and go through that competitive bid process and you just helped clarify that thank you other comments questions or i mean this is a discussion tonight um uh, um i don't think we're necessarily agreeing one direction or another um i i guess i'm just trying to gain a sense from other directors how you'd like to proceed this evening i know jp you were very keen that we started moving forward on this. I just want to make sure we're clear on what our next steps are. Yeah, I, I kind of guess would echo what Sean said. Uh, you know, I want it to happen. And if, you know, Dwayne's saying we need some more technical expertise, I think, you know, um, again, I do think we will, will realize cost savings, um, which, you know, again, is a way we can recoup some of that. Um, I mean, money spent on a consultant that gets you what you need is money, uh, would be money well spent if we need that. Okay. Yeah, and I would, this is Rathina, sorry. Um, my video isn't working right now. Um, but my uh, preference would be to lean on um, the advice from Dwayne and his team on what the next steps would be because they do have some of that information already. And some of that, he may not have that expertise of writing what we need, but um, he knows where we're headed and what we have within our buildings. And I think that would be um, important to have them at that conversation to ensure that we're getting that information and making that right decision. So if an RFP will get us, you know, more options to look at and Dwayne gets the help he needs, the, to do the technical writing, I would support that. Thanks, Ruthina. So would an, an, a, a good next step be for Duane to take the lead in terms of trying to identify a consultant to help with the technical components of an RFP process? I would support that, uh, but in, uh, in hiring a consultant, that the consultant can actually look at the, the uh, or advise us on the uh, uh, PPA aspect, as well as the other uh, uh, options we have besides uh, PPA, is, is that correct, or is consultant only only going to work on uh, uh, the PPA approach? I suggest my thought somebody who could tell you if a purchase is the best option, PPA is the best option. What are the best placements for? And I, and I assume Dwayne and his staff had a really good knowledge of the buildings. Um, and for example, the megawatt also proposed putting panels on the grounds of the school buildings. And that's probably not an option in a lot of instances, but I think a consultant can work with your physical plant staff. And I think there probably is a, a wealth of information that Dwayne and his folks have that could really move that process along in, in, a, in a good, meaningful way. I would hope so. Um, I just, I wanted to circle back to something. I mean, I, Sean, I agree with your comment a few comments ago that it's not about saving money. It's about reducing the carbon footprint. And that's the commitment that we have to in, in the climate action plan. And, and that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, but Chase, did I hear, if there are alternate ways to reduce our carbon footprint that are cost effective, besides solar panels, I mean, I certainly would want to reduce the footprint the very most we can, but at the least price. 
a least expensive option. And so if there are other alternatives that maybe we can leverage relationships with our existing partners, I wonder if we can explore those uh, before spending money hiring a consultant um, just to make sure that solar is really what we have to do to move forward on this. I, I might add one more thought for you too, Lisa, and that is over the last eight, nine years, the district has done a lot to reduce energy consumption. In fact, we have studies that show us that we're 40% 40, 40 more efficient than the average school district in the state of Iowa to start with. And that was even mentioned by you and I in the Climate Action Plan. And if you recall that what that plan said was there are two areas that we can look at to reduce our carbon footprint because we're already energy efficient would be the use of fossil fuels and our transportation our buses and the, and the fuels that they use. Those were the two single largest areas for us to concentrate on. Our buildings are really efficient. We're making them more efficient all the time. So I, I really think if you look back to that report, that will give you the direction you need. It's those two areas, transportation and fossil fuels, that we need to look at. But to your question, Lisa, yes, and I, you know, we need to do some more exploring, but that has been, and Steve, you can maybe talk a little bit about this too, about what we've heard from some of our current energy providers and some of the things that they're doing that will also further reduce um, or, or provide greener energy and, and uh, less consumption to our buildings. Yeah, so remember there's there's things that we can do on site, but then there's also things that we can do from that perspective of um, prodding, uh, pushing, lobbying uh, our energy providers to ensure that they're actually uh, going as green as possible, whether that's uh, uh, our main provider with MidAmerican or our other two sub providers. Um, recognizing that uh, regardless of how much energy we produce, if you remember the report that was given to us uh, through UNI, um, we'll never get away from buying energy. And so the, the cleanest, greenest energy we can buy, um, as he shared with us, has the, the greatest impact uh, on our carbon footprint overall. And so I, while I, I would agree with all of you that uh, um, what we can do on site uh, has a, an enormous impact both uh, on the bottom line uh, of our carbon footprint and also on being able to demonstrate to the community our commitment to it. Um, the biggest return on investment for us is really getting Mid-American in particular um, to follow through on their commitment and, and uh, get their uh, power sources as green as possible as quickly as possible. So question, um uh, in terms of next steps, I mean, I would I would be very comfortable with with um, Chase and Dwayne taking the lead on next steps on this. Um, it sounds like um, leveraging this the knowledge and the reports and the data that we have gathered, which has been significant, the UNI report and other activities, um, and you know, coming back with. Uh, what an RFP would look like, you know, I, I'm comfortable moving in that direction. It sounds like the administrative team is is uh, looking for that support and I'm happy to support that as a means of helping us move forward on this really important matter and helping, you know, chart a path to cutting our emissions. Any other comments from directors? Everyone's comfortable with Dwayne? Dwayne, you just got another job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would support that, but I, I am okay with if, if it takes finding a consultant yeah. uh, to help with that, I, I'd be in favor of that. I, I will tell you because, you know, I mentioned early in this process, right? Like I was moved to put solar on my house, right? And the company that sells the stuff comes out to your house and says, I can put these many solar panels on your house and it's going to be great. And I feel like they were honest with me and did a great job, right? But mine's a house with a roof and, you know, and a residential house that there's a lot of experience there. So having that company, you know, come into the entire school district and say, this is what solar is going to look like for you guys. It's, you know, you you talk to five different companies, they're going to tell you five different things, right? So I, I totally get the need to have somebody who's not trying to sell you something help with that. And it's not 
you know, tell you what you should do, but help you ask the right questions maybe of those companies that are going to then sell you this stuff. Um, it worked for me in my, in May, I just paid my bill. I actually, well, I didn't pay my bill. I actually made more energy than I used in May. And I don't know how that's possible with four people at home using the internet like crazy, but it was awesome. So, um, solar is a, is a great thing, but I agree with all of the other options, right? We, we do have very green schools. We're doing all these things, you know, the leverage we can put on our providers is great. I mean, I think we say, well, if you're not going to go green yourself, we are going to do it on our end and we're going to stop buying energy from you. We're going to buy it from a PPA. We're going to just make it ourselves, right? That's the leverage that we have with, you know, Mid-American or any other uh, energy company. Um, so I think that's important too, but uh, I'd be in favor of figuring out how, you know, what kind of, um, you know, uh, consultants are out there to help us with this process to move it forward um, sooner than later. I think that the faster we get it, the quicker we can get towards our goal and get the bonus of saving money in the end. Um, but the quicker we'll stop using fossil fuels. So what I would propose first, Janet, is to uh, find four or five consultants that are out there see how friendly they are to educational institutions and large institutions and, and investigate their background and find the right consultant to assist us. And then we'll move forward with the RFP process. Yeah, that sounds great, Dwayne. Thank you. I, I would say the other thing is we'll, we'll work on a timeline so we can keep you all uh, updated about kind of what we think the pace of this work. Uh, Chase, um, on time, on budget, 440 million. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking to the master here, Chase. <laughs> you couldn't let that one go. That's wow. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, I was just told to be quiet, so I will. <laughs> That's really good. So we're good. Thank you, Dwayne, for taking that forward, um, and we'll look for an update at the appropriate time. Um, and I think you're hearing sense of urgency and from the board, but you know, you, you need to define and 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 follow the process that that work is going to work um, for you, Dwayne. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Joe, for presenting that. Appreciate it very much. Um, super helpful. Uh, good conversation, folks. I'm going to move us on to um, our action items for the night. Um, we've got three. We've, the first up is uh, approving a resolution for the temporary construction easement at 1355 Barrington Road. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any conversation or comment? Hearing none, Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. These next two are always uh, near and dear to my heart, but um, we have a, a t negotiated teaching agreement for 2020 and 2021. Um, a motion to approve. So moved. <clears throat> so moved. Second. Any discussion? None, Kim, and I'd just like to make one comment, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, sorry, and, and I won't belabor it, but I just really want to, uh, first off, thank our teachers for their, for their tireless efforts every, every day. And, and specifically, I'd like to thank Brady. Brady does such a nice job collaborating with us, providing leadership for the ICEA and really across the district. And he's so very complimentary of the um, leadership team when he talks about the work that we do with him. And so I just feel like uh, this is an appropriate time to really show our thanks and our gratitude for everything that, that Brady does. Um, he's truly an asset, not only to students. Um, I know that he does great work in the classroom, but we're lucky that he carves out part of his day to help provide, provide us some help um, at a district level. And so thank you so much for Brady. And uh, again, it was just another great uh, year of collaboration. And I think something that we should be proud of as an organization of the district, the relationship we have with the ICBA. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chase. I mean, I I deeply appreciate that, and um, you know, the the feeling is mutual. I think the partnership that we have with the district and the commitment of our board uh, to our teachers and our staff, and um, you know, it's just it's tremendous. So it helps us. You know, maybe one of your most contentious times can be negotiations, and it, in the last few years, I really feel like we've turned that around, and it really is it's collaborative, and it's a really honest, candid discussion. Um, so thank you. And I, I have to say too, um, I just want to thank the board for your statements and your commitment on behalf of our students and staff of color. 
Um, and that is something that's, uh, that is really meaningful. You know, Black Lives Matter and we must confront the ways that racism is embedded in our institutions. And we, ICA, recognize and accept our individual and collective responsibilities to be um, committed to that work and action. And we appreciate your commitments tonight and your work that you have done. We know where your hearts are and we know that you're committed to sustained action. And that's true of our board members and our administrative colleagues. And I just want you to know we're gonna be your partner uh, in that work. So thanks, the negotiations process was fantastic. I really appreciate everyone's work and commitment on that, but I think even more important, the statements uh, that were made and, and the actions that were taken are deeply appreciated. Thank you, Brady, and thank you, Chase, and I feel remiss that I was rushing a little bit, um, and when I said near and dear to my heart, it's because since I've been on the board, the spirit of trust and collaboration has been the norm, and um, I haven't personally experienced some of the more contentious types of, of, of and so I, I mean, I just figured this is how it always is, <laughs> We're highly collaborative. We trust each other. We work together really, really well. Um, and so um, it is, I guess, and, and I need to be reminded that this is perhaps unique in our district and, um, and something that we should treasure and continue to nourish and, and grow. So yeah, thank you, Brady, to your team. Thank you, Chase, for your leadership in the negotiations process and for the board for your support throughout the process too. So um, Many more years of this, many more years of this, folks, is what I'm hoping we can uh, maintain. So, um, can I something real quick. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on something that Sean said earlier. I think it was Sean. Sorry if it wasn't. Um, one thing that we kind of always get hammered for is um, our, it, well, not always hammered, but we have a, a budget, and a lot of our budget is paid towards people, and that's kind of what we're talking about right here. Um, but I think it's super important. Sean nailed it. Like the end game of all of us that are here in the district is the success of kids. And um, without the staff that we have across the district, teachers all the way up and down the board, um, we wouldn't be able to have successful students. Um, I can tell you that me, uh, Lisa, and Ruthina, um, think so highly of teachers, we decided to marry them and JP went into the profession. So there's at least four of us on here that uh, have nothing but respect for teachers. So you'll hear that a lot from us, but um, I just wanted to uh, put that out there that uh, I think the staff across the board is super important in this district to uh, ensure the success of students. And that's what we're all working for. Thanks, Paul. I'll just make a, a brief comment. Um, just how I felt after our negotiation sessions with the, I, I don't think I've, I don't know if I felt better about many times than, than that night, that the way that it happened, the efficiency of it, the collaborative spirit, um, and having been involved, uh, you know, when the process wasn't as, as clean, um, I mean, that was a real, a real joy for a lot of, a lot of days, and I'm, I'm very proud to, to vote yes to approve uh, both of these contracts tonight. Any other comments? Thank you for all of that. And I'm trying to remember if we have a motion and a second. We do. And I think we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. And next up is the pair educator negotiated agreement for 2020, 2021. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Okay. Second. Ooh, that was a tie. <laughs> Any discussion? Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you all so much. Thank um, you. Next up is the director liaison report. Um, things that directors would like to highlight. I just want to highlight the uh, the graduations. Uh, you can see I listed it on there a few times because I spent a lot of time at the graduations this, um, whenever it was, two weekends ago. Um, and I thought they were great. Each school, uh, including Transitions, uh, Tate, West, City, and Liberty, I was able to get to all of them. They were all a little different. Uh, but they were all great. 
And the reason I say that is because there was not one time that I experienced um, witnessing or talking to families that went through there um, that weren't appreciative that they, we were able to provide them with something. Um, it was great to see the staff uh, that was on hand at City, at West, at Tate, um, that they were, it was like closure for them. I know at City High at one point when I was there for a couple hours, one of the teachers was taking selfies with kids as they came off the stage. I mean, there were tears. It was just like, and it was for her, it was a, a closure and excitement that she was able to see these kids um, graduate. And I th like I said, the parents were appreciative. Um, the running joke that I think I told Steve at one of them, uh, a couple of times I would hear people walk across the stage at City High and, and tell um, Mr. Bacon that they had kids coming up and that this was great, that we should do graduations like this all the time. And his response was, three minutes for you, 20 hours for me. So, I mean, it was, although it was great, uh, I do look forward to hopefully returning to uh, traditional graduations in the large group setting, because I think that's also awesome for kids, having experienced it and seen it and been through it. Um, but just a, a big shout out to all of the um, schools um, that put together stuff um, for the graduation and the way they did it. And it was much appreciated, uh, not only from the parents and and kids i hope but uh, i appreciate it as a board member being able to witness that and it was it was it was fun for me to go uh even unseen i was you know in the back or wherever and just being able to watch it because uh, i think a lot of us like i said earlier we do this to see the success of kids and when you see them graduate and walk across that stage it really means something at least to me that uh, i'm doing good work in this district because you're watching the kids um, graduating. So I just wanted to put that out there as part of my liaison report. I'd also <clears throat> like to uh, uh, just say that uh, we attended the Black Voices Project meeting uh, last night, actually. <clears throat> Some 41 or 42 participants at this meeting, many uh, from the district staff or were district staff members. Um, and there was a very, uh, I think, very frank, honest, open discussion about uh, a number of issues that, uh, that we all want to deal with. So I really appreciate the leadership of that group, and I appreciate all the people that came last night. I would add that, the, you know, the event in uh, Coralville on Sunday, they mentioned then that uh, Coralville was going to start a Black Voices project, and, you know, I... We've had board representation in Iowa City, so I would I would hope that we can be allowed to have some board representation down there in Corville and um, be part of that, and you know maybe get it up in North Liberty, and I can go to those because closer. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that to see that they're they're expanding. I think that's a good thing. Charlie and, and Ruthina, just on that point, and Lisa, because you were there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, but. Roy Sam made it sound like she, they weren't going to necessarily open another chapter in Corville, but they would want them to join the current like discussions with you guys. Is that how you understood it? Or do you also yeah. understand it, that they would open up a new chapter? No, that's what I understood as well, that um, for right now, they're encouraging folks that want to be involved in um, the activities that the Black Voices Project uh, is engaged in. They should... Um, start coming to the meetings right now, they're all on Zoom. So it's really easy to do it in your home. Um, but it's not, I, I didn't think it was, you know, by community, you know, like Iowa City. I don't, it doesn't sound as though this current Black Voices is just for people in Iowa City or particular areas. It's open to anyone interested in the topics that the Black Voices Project discusses. I, I would agree with Ruthina on that, yeah. Anyone except a fourth board member? Well, we did our best last night, come on. Paul was very gracious in, uh, in uh, uh, designating himself as an observer, not as a meeting participant, so. Um, I do just want to circle back and echo Paul's comments about graduation. Um, I wasn't able to make tapes, but I made the other three. And like the building 
admin and staff worked so hard on them and they were great and every single family got to celebrate um, differently but in their own way and there were beaming faces under masks and um, I, I know and the buildings incorporated the teachers and so I Jason went on Friday and some of the teachers got to go and see their students and I think that that was really meaningful for the teachers too um, so just thanks like it, 20 hours of pomp and circumstance uh, is a lot and um, uh, not easy. And it's, I think, really appreciated. A uh, great, great job. And I just want to highlight, uh, you know, I've been going to a lot of the rallies and protests that's been going on um, after the murder of George Floyd. And it has been um, just very reassuring to not only see fellow board members there, but to also see our teachers and especially our administrators, building administrators, as well as um, you know district level administrators out there walking, picking up the cause, saying the same chants, being actively engaged with um, the speakers at all of these rallies, as well as, you know, wanting to know what more can we do as a district? And really, from what I can see, walking away energized to make sure that change will happen. You know, I saw, um, you know, without naming folks, because it's not, I'm, I don't want people to think I'm trying to shame people, but um, the rally I was at, uh, the teachers hosted on Saturday, I was just really engaged, just happy to see so many of our administrators there, um, both building level and like I said, ESC. So I, I just really want to say thank you for that. Um, I know you don't have to be thanked for that, but I think it's important to know um, that our leaders are willing to pick up the cause for our students as well as teachers of color. And put it on a line with them and fight for what's right. So thank you to um, everybody that's been picking up that call. Thanks folks, anything else to add here? Um, moving to agenda setting. Um, we've had we have a couple I think agendas presented. Um, there's a PNG committee meeting. Yes, oh my God, my internet's slowing down. We've got a PNG committee on um, June 16th, um, and then we've got a, a board agenda for the 23rd with um, consent agenda, uh, return to learn update, presentations on um, the canopy study long range facility master plan update and then the action item around superintendent directions 3JC or sorry 3J6 that we discussed earlier tonight anything else for our um, June 23rd board meeting I would like got some to stuff. add oh, go ahead Paul I would like to add uh, and I don't care what happens probably at the end um, just some time for us to acknowledge Steve um, on his last meeting because I know that when his resignation was turned in we all kind of said we would like to say something at that last meeting. So uh, I, I would like to say something at that meeting if you could put on the agenda. Absolutely, fantastic. And it's it's kind of, it's gonna be very unsatisfying doing it via Zoom. I'm just gonna say um, for, I think for all of us, Steve, but it's a great, and yes, 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 yes. And uh, someone else was trying to jump in yeah, I, I had uh, three things, and one was the Steve Murley roast. I think that's what we should put it in the agenda. Um, but the other two, and it could be at that meeting, or I think one of them kind of needs to be a closed session, but I, I've been thinking about all the stuff that we need to get going again. I, feel, I, I was talking with some other folks not that long ago that I felt like the administration has been working their butts off, but our board has been kind of just sitting here receiving all the information and we talk about all the things we need to do and I want to kind of get back to doing some of it and I know we have a lot of heavy lifts so the, but there was a couple of um, things I wanted to bring back um, that we have had some discussions on but we haven't really landed anywhere and one of those is um, the Roosevelt building um, you know kind of next steps of what we're going to do there, right? We need to make a decision. Are we gonna keep it or are we gonna sell it? And so that's a discussion that the board needs to have and it probably needs to happen at a closed session 
Um, but it, it needs to happen because right now we're just paying to have a building sit there. Um, and then the other one, um, we voted basically to not do anything this year on our secondary um, voluntary transfer. Um, so I think we need to come back and decide how we want to do that because uh, I think there was an agreement that we needed to have the conversation of where we wanted to go with it. It just was uh, kind of too soon to try and make that decision or make a change at that at that point in time right for the falls but i i think sooner than later we'll want to bring that discussion back as to how we want to move forward um on secondary voluntary transfer so that can happen any time really to have that discussion it could just be a, a discussion item at any board meeting um the result thing i do think it needs to be a, a closed session at, at the very least before we take any action on that on Roosevelt, so timing on Roosevelt. I mean, you're right. We're paying it. We're paying to just have an empty building, basically. And, and then I know there's some options that we want to consider that we've talked about before. So, um, I mean, I would ask, you know, the administrators' um, timing from your perspective to get some direction for Roosevelt. Is this something we want to try and do yet in June, or do we want to try to get this in a closed session in July? Just I'm looking for a sense of timing. We certainly could. We've got uh, the data I think that you need from the appraisal standpoint. Uh, it might be an opportunity from, uh, if you think about uh, conversations we've had at previous board meetings about property acquisition, uh, I might give you the opportunity to have uh, Joe walk you through the disposal process, uh, understand where the funds go, what they can be used for, um, what kind of timing we're looking at, et cetera, so that you understand it both from a, a practical standpoint, a revenue standpoint, and a legal standpoint. So we have the data, so do we want to try and do a closed session on this as early as the second meeting in June or a first meeting in July? Um, are we already doing a closed session June 23rd on Lucas? Um, yes, so let's, that's a good reminder. Thank you, Lisa. We'll need to push this into July then. Maybe we target the first uh, meeting in July. Does that sound good? And just a note on policy and governance, you guys noticed there, if you looked at the agenda, there's uh, the 600 series and that's the last full series we have to get through before we go back and kind of touch up some of the things that we we mess we decided to um, have other people look at so uh, just an update to the board we're getting closer and uh, the 600 series shouldn't take us as long as some of the other series did so uh, we we may still reach the goal of getting through all of these things before Steve has to leave that's awesome um, Janet, I would ask uh, if the board would be willing to pull those two reports from the next board meeting. Um, our approach was really to cover some of that in the overall annual report we, we gave you uh, tonight. Dwayne mentioned the canopy study, and, and we do want to come back to the board in short order on next steps on the facilities master plan 2.0, because we know we want to keep that front center and keep yeah. it moving. Um, we actually think that maybe a work session would, would be um, would be great as well, but can we just get together um, on the admin side and, and find a date and then uh, submit that through yeah. Matt and potentially Steve at, at your next agenda setting meeting? Yeah, that's perfect. We'll take great. your lead on that one. Appreciate it. So Roosevelt, um, so yeah, kudos to PNG, uh, Roosevelt first meeting in, in July, secondary voluntary transfer matter. It feels like we can schedule, it doesn't feel like a sense of urgency perhaps for this next meeting in June, but sometime this summer, Sean, just so that we get out ahead of it, make sure we make the decisions in the proper time to communicate effectively any changes that might come with that. Yeah. Okay, anything else on an agenda? Steve, get ready for being roasted. Actually, you may be happy this is gonna be a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. So I just want to point out that if we put Steve Roast on the agenda, then community comment <laughs> comment on any part of the agenda. Take a pass on that. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So maybe we do need to change the title of that agenda item. That's hilarious. That's that's really really good. Yeah. No, it's yeah. I won't get sad tonight. I'll get sad next um, the next board meeting. So um, anything else, folks, for the good of the cause. What a, what, a, what a board meeting tonight. We covered a lot. Really, really well done. Thanks to everyone who contributed and, and you know, stay safe, stay healthy to everyone. And with that, I would take a, a motion to adjourn. So moved.
Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Good night, y'all. Have a good rest of your evening. See ya. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.